All rise for the jury. All right, we are back on a record on Mark Jensen, 2002 CF314. Let's have the appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. The State of Wisconsin appears by Special Prosecutor Robert Jamboys, Deputy District Attorney Carly McNeil, and Public Service Special Prosecutor Beverly Jamboys. Attorneys Bridget Krause, Jeremy Perry, and Mackenzie Renner appear on behalf of Mr. Mark Jensen, who appears in person. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we are here on uh, January 19th, 2023. We're going to continue with the uh, cross-examination of Lieutenant Rasberg, who's still under oath. Uh, who's doing the cross? Your Honor, they hadn't started the cross yet. The, the state did have some housekeeping matters we wanted to address per pertaining to the admission of exhibits into evidence, if we could go through that real quickly. before. Um, so the state would move exhibits S1 through S5 into evidence, subject to cross-examination. Um, the state would also move exhibit S17, S18, S19, S20, 21, 22, 23. Oh, those were, those had been received. I'm sorry, S19 had, had not been received. Then also S26 and S27, S30 and S31. S33, 34, 35, and 36. And I would point out, Your Honor, that with respect to S33, it's described in the exhibit list as the checkbook with initials JCJ. It's actually Julie Jensen's day planner, not her checkbook. It's about the size of a checkbook, so I can see how the clerk might have thought it was a checkbook, but it's not a checkbook, it's a day planner. Um, then we'd also move, let's see, S42 and S45 into evidence. Get those Subject cross-examination. Did you get the numbers? All right, the clerk got the numbers they're received. <coughs> we are done with your direct, correct? I am, Your Honor. All right. Okay, who's doing the cross? Go ahead, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Ratzberg, when did you say you've reti you were retired? I'm, I'm having a little trouble hearing you, Mr. Perry. Uh, I retired in 2012. And what was the last report that you ever did in this case? I, I don't recall. Certainly nothing since December uh, 2012. Correct. Okay. Um, you testified in this case in 2008. Correct. Would you have done anything uh, after 2008 on this case? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, did you 
What was the last interview of a witness in this case that you conducted? Uh, possibly in February of 2012 when I obtained a manuscript and book. Okay. Um, nothing for the last 10 years? Not that I recall. And prior to coming here yesterday, did you review your reports in this case? Yes. And did you review your prior testimony? Yes. You were uh, the lead investigator in this case? Yes. Were you really the only investigator in this case? Primarily. You decided which witnesses to interview? For the most part, yes. Okay. Uh, you decided when to interview them? Yes. What evidence to collect? Yes. And you made the decision about what evidence to forward to the crime lab? Yes. And when to forward it? Sometimes. Were there instances where you didn't decide what uh, and when to forward it to the crime lab? Uh, occasionally on some of the uh, evidence I had to make an appointment at the crime lab. So I may have wanted to take it up there earlier than I uh, wanted to, but I had to make an appointment to get in there and explain the case. I see. So it wasn't entirely your decision. You had to wait for other people. Correct. And if you made the wrong decision on uh, what evidence to collect, there's a risk that it would be just gone forever. Correct. Like the search of the house, right? Yes. You were there on December 3rd? Yes. And on December 4th searching? Yes. And really anything that you didn't collect at that point, um, that was maybe it, right? Correct. And you, of course, recognize that if witnesses aren't spoken to promptly, uh, memories can be affected. Yes. By the passage of time? Yes. By speaking with other people? Yes. By reading media reports? Yes. And this was a case where there were a lot of media reports? At the time of trial, there was. And what others say to people can cause bias. Correct. And bias can affect memories. Yes. You were also responsible for making sure that evidence wasn't contaminated in the case. Yes. Okay, and you did that by the process that you were collecting it? Yes. Storing it? Yes. And then submitting it, right? Correct. And you made all those decisions on December 3rd, 1998. In reference to what we recovered on December 3rd, that is correct. About how to search and what to take from the Jensen family home. Yes. Now, when you got there, you weren't the first officer on scene, correct? Correct. Uh, who was? I believe... Uh I'm unsure, but I, however, I know that uh, Sergeant Riley was uh, there on scene, and he was the supervisor uh, that was on scene before I arrived. Okay, do you know how long Sergeant Riley was on scene before you got there? Probably, uh, and, and again, I'm estimating uh, about an hour. Oh, and um, when you got there, were uh, David and Douglas still there, the kids? No. The cause of death was not obvious, correct? Correct. And you testified yesterday that you received information that Julie Jensen was depressed. On December 3rd? Right. Yes. And that she had recently started taking an antidepressant? Yes. Had recently started taking Ambien. Objection, Your Honor. This is all hearsay. He's not, he's not even getting the source of the information. Well, I think he talked about this information on his direct. It was just, just yesterday so, afternoon. Let's, let's continue. Go ahead. Is that right? Yes. And you learned some of this from the EMTs that were on the scene before you. 
I did not talk to any EMTs at the scene. Oh, did you get this information from Sergeant Riley? No. Well, who did you get this information from? Mr. Jensen. Okay. That's, uh, that's the basis for my objection, Your Honor. It's hearsay. Well, this one is sustained then. <clears throat> I'd request that the witness's previous statements or concerning this information be stricken and the jury be instructed to disregard it. Well, I don't... I don't know if he got all the information. Did he just say he got all the information from yes. Mrs. Jensen? All right, then it is stricken. And would you instruct the jury, please, to disregard that information that came from this witness? On and cross? you are to disregard that testimony, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Thank you. You explained to Mark Jensen that you wanted to get his consent to search the home. You testified to that yesterday, correct? Correct. You wanted to look through personal items? Yes. And to take items that you wanted to investigate further? Correct. And you received full cooperation and that consent that you asked for? Yes. You looked for all medications? Yes. You looked for any toxins? Yes. You looked for any evidence of struggle? Yes. You even checked the windows? Correct. You looked for fluids? Yes. Um, you looked for, did you look for fluids on the bed? Yes. Carpet? Yes. And you checked bathrooms? Yes. And you agree it was important to not make any assumptions about evidence at the scene, correct? Correct. Because you didn't know exactly what you were looking for? Yes. You had to find anything that might be later relevant? Correct. <clears throat> on direct you testify that you took samples from all of the drains not all of the drains okay which drains did you not take samples from i have them uh, labeled in my report and on the bottles i believe it's the uh the bathroom and then the middle bathroom what other drains were there in the house uh there was one of them uh, i'd have to review the video again to, uh, i depict it in there but there was one that was completely glued and uh, uh in fact i pondered whether or not to saw Mr. Jensen's drains from un underneath his sink and I thought possibly that would be excessive because uh, then he wouldn't be able to operate the uh, drain that I would destroy in getting it. So there was one drain that I decided not to take the fluid from uh, because uh, it, it would have done damage. Okay, so I, I think that you testified that at least from the middle bathroom and master bathroom, you um, took s the samples were taken of the drain. Correct. Okay, so that would mean not the kitchen. I think you are correct, yes. Okay. <clears throat> How many bathrooms did the house have? Two. We saw the video yesterday of the walk through the house. Correct. And you noted at the beginning of the video, that was your voice on the video, right? It was. Okay. That uh, Julie Jensen's body had been moved by the firefighters before you got there. Yes. You remember that? Yes. Okay. And I noticed as you walked through the house and handled certain things, you were doing that with your bare hands. Sometimes. Uh, and, and again, uh, to operate the camera, uh, I uh, couldn't do it with, with the gloves, and if you notice from the photos, and they're in evidence, we used a substantial amount of gloves in there. In fact, I still have them in evidence, and uh, uh, so there were times that the gloves just didn't, uh, uh, in, in, in wearing them, I couldn't uh, perform the duty that I wanted to, but uh, most of the time I did wear rubber gloves, and uh, that's uh, a matter of my usual technique. So it was just like uh, for convenience sakes at different times that you would just not have gloves on? I wouldn't say it was uh, con convenience sake. It was a matter for me to operate my evidence collection. Uh, I couldn't, uh, for example, the video camera uh, with those gloves on there, the uh, buttons were rather small. And you noticed in the video, I comment about that Tiny on buttons. the trouble I'm having with it. So. Uh, wearing gloves and operating the video camera just wouldn't work. <clears throat> I'm going to show you some photos from the scene.
These are marked as exhibits, oh, let's see, they're not in order, 40, 35, 41, 46, 47, 37, 38, 36, 39. They're in this crazy order, but that's the order I'm going to ask you about them. Have you looked at these, Mr. Jambos? I, I, I'm going to look at them right now, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Yes, I have. The state has no objection, Your Honor. I've seen all those photos. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> if you could just page through them and let me know if you recognize them as being from the from the scene. Yes, these are from uh, photos that I taken at the Jensen home on December 3rd, 1998. You took these or did, um, uh, was there another officer taking pictures? It, it was a uh, joint effort. I believe uh, Sergeant Hunter took these photos and of course I was there with him as he took it. But you've seen those before? I have, yes. Okay. I want to start by asking you about um, Exhibit 40 and we can put that on the, uh, on the screen. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of the nightstand that was uh, next to Julie's bed. Julie would have been off to the left there. And it's uh, uh, the reason I took those photos or had them taken was there's a glass with uh, a, a watery substance in it. And there's a pink bowl with crackers. And then there's a ceramic blue bowl with a spoon with, mac with, a spoon mac with <coughs> macaroni and cheese in it. Okay. And the blue cup that's got liquid in it. Correct. And did you take that liquid? Yes. Did you take the cup? I don't recall. Was that submitted to the crime lab? The substance that was in the blue uh, cup was submitted to the crime lab, yes. And, but the cup itself was not? I don't believe so. And you took the two bowls? Yes. And it's the, um, the blue bowl that has mac and cheese in it? Correct. And it's mac and cheese, Just you just visually identified it as that? Yes. And the other one was, had, uh, what did you say, crackers? Crackers, yes. Now those weren't submitted to the crime lab, were they? Yes, they were. The bowls were? Yes. Were the, was the mac and cheese and the crackers submitted? Uh, um, you, you are correct. Uh, the mac and cheese was submitted and the crackers I did confer with the crime lab when I went up there and submitted that. And I spoke with the analysts there because I had some questions about some other items. One in particular was the glass that's on the counter. You don't have that photographed here. But uh, I was concerned whether they needed that for testing of any uh, substance. And primarily what I was looking for was antifreeze. And the analyst advised me that uh, he could not test to see if there was some uh, substance on there of poison, in particular antifreeze or ethylene glycol on there. So they elected only to take the food itself. In this case, it would be the macaroni and cheese and the crackers and, of course, the substance that was in the blue cup. You remember testifying earlier in this case that, um, that those items weren't tested because they were all eaten by mice? Yes, that, 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 that is accurate. Uh, what happened uh, before they were eaten by mice was it was submitted to the crime lab, and the crime lab determined that there was no poisoning or ethylene glycol or antifreeze in it. And then while it was stored at the Pleasant Prairie Police Department, uh, we, had, we had a mouse problem. And uh, the mice came in and ate all of the macaroni and cheese and crackers in the bowls. But however, it was tested before the mice ate them. If you could turn to um, Exhibit 35. And what's that a picture of? That is a picture of the master 
bathroom. Now you see some uh, Dixie cups next to the sink, correct? Correct. Those weren't seized, were they? They were not. And they weren't sent for testing? No, they weren't. If you could put up uh, Exhibit 41. Please look at 41. That's the uh, Jensen family den? Correct. And that's the, the computer room, right? Yes. Okay. And is this the view from the hallway looking in? Yes. <clears throat> and that was the positioning of the computer and the computer monitor uh, as it was on December 3rd, right? Yes. Had you ever been to the house before December 3rd inside to see no. the computer den? I'm sorry. No. You'd not? Uh, please, I, I go repeat your question, please. I spoke over you. Prior to December 3rd, had you uh, seen that um, computer room? No. And the positioning of the door, that door is just partially closed in this picture, right? Yes. And if it was closed even just a little bit more, you wouldn't be able to see the computer screen? That would be correct. Now, from that room, you took the Jensen family computer, right? Correct. You didn't take the monitor. You just took the, uh, the CPU. Correct. <clears throat> and you recovered a cigar box with zip disks? Yes. That was in this room? Yes. And on the desk, you found a web printout on paroxetine, correct? I recall recovering that, but I'm not absolutely sure that it was on the desk, but I do recall recovering that. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 50. Yes, sir. You recognize this? I do. And it was recovered from the Jensen home on December 3rd? Correct. Okay, you don't remember if it was in the den? I don't recall. It was at the Jensen household, though. Okay. <clears throat> Did you look through this on December 3rd? Not likely. Have you looked through it ever? Yes. It identifies what paroxetine is, right? It identifies on page one that it's um, the brand name is Paxil, correct? Correct. And the printout is how many pages long? 25. And on the bottom right corner, it looks like this was printed out on December 2nd, 1998, correct? That is correct. And there are notations in this packet, aren't there? I see notations here on my evidence mark. Is that what you're referring to, or no? On uh, and and they're not like they're not words. I think, but just on, on maybe flip to page twenty-two. Do you see some some things starred? On page 22, yes, I see a star on there. You know, what's, what's the star next to? Objection. It's hearsay, Your Honor. Whoever put that star on there would need to testify as to what the star is next to. It's hearsay. It's a hearsay document, and the state objects. Well, didn't he find this document at the residence? He did, Your Honor. But if let's say he uh, maybe, I don't want to have this argument in front of the All jury. All right, let, let me just look at it really quick, page 22. And Judge, I'm not asking who said what. I'm just asking to describe the document that he found. And your question again, for the record? I asked him, uh, there's an asterisk, and I asked him, what's that next to? I think he can ask that question. <clears throat> 
go ahead and answer it. Yes, there's a star and it's uh, next to the star is on page 22 is uh, uh, a definition of nervous system or a description of it. And on uh, page 25, is there a notation? Again, Your Honor, I object. May counsel approach? Uh, go on the back, folks. For the record, this is Exhibit 50, right? Yes. And these, this was found in the Jensen residence on December 3rd, 1998, correct? That's, that's been his testimony, yes. Yeah. And where was this found, do you know? I do, Judge, I, I don't recall, but I do recall that it was from the Jensen home. And did you find it? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm yes. not going to let them ask questions of who put the mark on or... But if the document was found, I think it, it's testimony we can allow. I don't have a problem, Your Honor, with them asking questions about this document about paroxetine. I have an objection to them asking questions about any markings or notations that were on there. And the reason I object is the only reasonable inference is that the person that asterisk, put an asterisk there and then underlined certain portions of it, um, the person that did that is almost certainly Mark Jensen. And um, his purpose in doing that at the time, I would surmise, the state's theory is that he would have done that in order to direct Julie's attention to that to explain her untoward reaction. Well, we don't know who did it, and that's not going to come in front of the jury. Well, <clears throat> Your Honor, that's just it. So th these, these notations are um, they're hearsay, and we don't know who did it. And since we don't know who did it, it should not be coming in, and the, we should not be asking the jury to speculate about what the significance of that asterisk is. That's not his question. He just asked where the mark was, what it was next to. Yes, and then he and was that's going, it. Yes, and, and Your Honor, then the next question would be, so what was underlined there? And then have the witness read what's underlined. Um, all these asterisks and underlying, um, those are hearsay statements. And I'm not going to allow that. We're just going to let him say what was marked. I mean, it's, uh, I also don't know who typed up, you know, at its source on whatever website, who typed up this informational packet on paroxetine, but it's, this is really no different than what's going to be coming in terms of testimony about um, all the computer stuff. This is, it's just truly a description of the evidence found. And I do intend on asking what was underlined. I'm not asking who underlined it or who said what about it, or who described it to Detective Ratsburg. I'm just asking him to uh, describe this packet of evidence that he seized from the Jensen home on December 3rd. And there could be inferences, but I'm not asking or eliciting hearsay. I think, I think it's, I'm gonna allow it. It was found in the home by the lead detective. We're not gonna get into who made the mark or try to explain uh, who made the asterisk, but it was found. It's part of the record. I see. Well, Your Honor, um, this, the state objects to it. And I understand. As, as hearsay, um, but the court has ruled, and yeah. we will adhere to the so court's we'll ruling. bring back the jury. Thank you. And I'm sure you're going to ask questions about other items that were found in the house. So. Well, just on that point, Your Honor, any statement, the state can introduce any statement the defendant made because it's seen by a party. Oh. Well, and the defense cannot introduce I, I will remember when you make a question about some other item that was found, found in the house.
All right, bring them in. All rise for the jury. All right, we're back on the record on Mark Jensen, 2002 CF314. The jury's back in the courtroom. Go ahead, Mr. Perry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ratzberg, I was asking you about this um, Paxil printout, correct? Correct. Yes, you were. And that's now, that's what you see on the screen is what you see in front of you, correct? Correct. That's page one? Yes. Now, I asked you uh, earlier to go to page, um, well, actually, if you could... Um, Scroll down the bottom right corner. Um, on the bottom right corner, that's where it shows 12298, right? That is correct, yes. And does this look like it was just printed out from a computer to you? Yes. I asked you um, a few minutes before the break if uh, you could look at page 22, right? Correct. <clears throat> and at the top left, that's where the asterisk is? Correct. And that's next to you. It says um, nervous system, and then it has just a lot of, uh, would you describe those as, as symptoms, side effects? You know, there's a lot of words in there that I couldn't pronounce. I, I would not know what that definition is, quite frankly. Well, for instance, it says amnesia, CNS stimulation, concentration impaired, depression, emotional lability, vertigo, and then it says infrequent, right? So that was under frequent. Does that appear to you to be uh, describing, and maybe you don't know, but does, does it appear to be describing side effects? I don't know. Okay. If you could look at page um, 25. Yes. And could you read the line that's been underlined? Yes, I can read it. Out loud, please. Oh, very good. Any drug which affects the central nervous system can be drowsiness or lethargy. And then further underlined? Avoid drinking alcohol. In all the years since 1998, did you ever have this printout? or the zip disks that were recovered, did you ever have those checked for fingerprints? No. I'm gonna ask you to look at um, exhibits 46 and 47. These are, uh, these are pictures taken in the Jensen kitchen, right? He 
looks at 46 and 47, sir. Yes. If they're all jumbled up and you need a hand, let me know. Yes, they are. They are. Thank you. Uh, yes, I see uh, D46. Okay, and also, do you see 47 right next to it? Yes. Okay, looking at 46 first. Yes, sir. And uh, that's, it. I think in the video we saw you uh, handling, opening up one of the packages for Paxil that's right next to the sink, right? That is correct, you yes. Can see, you can see that in this picture? Yes. Okay. And I think even it maybe fell to the ground. It did. Um, there were some dirty dishes on the countertop. Can you point that out in the photo? Well, I'm looking, I'm, I guess what I'm asking is the, uh, the cups right behind the Paxil boxes on the countertop. Do you see those? The, the glasses? Yes, the glasses, yes. Okay. Were those all clean, <coughs> clean dishes, or do you remember? Well, I recall the glass that's uh, right behind the Paxil in uh, exhibit D46. Uh, as I stated earlier, that was one of the items I took up to the crime lab uh, with me and to determine if there was some type of poisoning or antifreeze or ethylene glyclo in it. And uh, so that particular glass I did uh, collect and I did have it reviewed by the crime lab uh, person. I asked you earlier about um, that you testified in 2008. Correct, yes. And you reviewed that testimony before um, coming here yesterday. Yes. And when you testified, that was substantially uh, more recent to 1998 than we are today, correct? It, it was, sir, yes. Yeah, and you were maybe, I mean, you were still um, actively a detective in 2008. Yes. Uh, you were asked about that glass in 2008. I believe so, yes. And I'm, counsel, I'm directing your attention on, pay, on February 1st, 2008, page 63, lines one through three. And the question is, and ultimately you never had tested that glass, true? Answer, yes, that's true. Does that sound familiar, that you did a visual investigation of that glass but did not submit it for testing? No, that wouldn't be accurate. I believe if you go further in the uh, transcript, that may be uh, more clear. Uh, my recollection of it is because uh, that glass concerned me and had uh, substance in it, and that was uh, things that we were looking for. I went to great lengths to obtain any substances from the Jensen home. And I recall uh, going over that glass in particular and wondering how we could test it or if it could be tested. And I consulted with the crime lab about that. Did you seize any of the other glasses? If they had fluid in them, likely. But if they didn't have any fluid in them, no. So if they appeared empty to you, you left them there? Correct. Correct. You're, you're, you're aware that the crime lab can detect residue? Uh, when I talked to them, uh, when I brought the items up there in De uh, December, that was my question and why I did what I did. And uh, uh, under the, the, their advice, that was uh, not what was told to me. Did you consult with the crime lab before doing the search on December 3rd about which items in the Jensen home to, to seize? No, I did not. And at the time, you didn't know what exactly you were looking for? Yes. Correct? Correct, yes. And did you swab those other glasses? Did I swab the glasses? No, I did not. Okay, no samples were taken from the glasses? That is correct, no samples. They appeared to not be clean dishes, though, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so... Presumably someone drank something out of them. That could be, yes. Okay. 
and if it visually to you appeared empty, it got left. Correct. If you could look at exhibits 36, 37, and 38. Well, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, we'll just go to um, uh, to 47. Um, really same, same countertop, different angle, correct? Correct. Okay, and the glass that you said had the uh, substance in it is right behind the Paxil boxes? Yes, that is correct. All right, and then there's one, two, three, four, other cups that are visible there, right? Yes. Okay, and those are the ones that you just left left as they were? Yes. <coughs> okay, if you could now go to exhibits 36. That's the fridge? Correct. And 37? Both of the refrigerator. Just the open fridge door, right? Correct. 38? Yes, 38 is of the uh, Jensen Home refrigerator. Okay. Beyond taking um, these pictures, nothing about the contents of the fridge were documented, correct? Other than you see the photographs here, that was our documentation of it. But as far as uh, uh, a written documentation, no. But no contents out of the fridge were taken out? No. Not even removed from the fridge at the scene? No. Just door was, doors were open, pictures were taken? Correct, yes. Um, nothing inside that fridge, uh, including any containers, were opened or tested? Correct. Exhibit 39. That appears to be a picture from the Jensen home. Okay, and that's a garbage can, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, I think yesterday you testified that you um, examined all the garbage in the home. We collected all the garbage with the exception of in the garage. We collected the uh, bags and uh, we likely collected this garbage uh, also as evidence. Okay, and it was collected. Uh, were Kleenexes, uh, paper towels and such, were that inside this garbage bag? Garbage can? It, it's garbage. I can't tell if it's Kleenex, but there are some crumpled up paper type objects in here. Uh, you know, well, in fact, your photo is much, much clearer than mine is uh, that you have up there. Uh, but I, I would assume that is accurate. And yeah. were those, uh, if there were Kleenexes, paper towels, were those tested? They were not, no. It was just, um, it was collected and that, that's where it ended? No, uh, when I went up to the crime lab, as I commented earlier, when I took up the glasses, because I wanted to have every, everything that was, uh, that I collected in there analyzed, and I asked the analyst at the crime lab, uh, that I have the garbage, and uh, I asked him if that was r relevant, could he test for it, and he told me he's got to have some fluid to test. If he has no fluid, he can't make a test uh, for ethylene glycol or uh, uh, anything of that matter. So I, I did consult with the crime lab on this evidence. However, they, they told me that uh, the, the, unless I had a substance like I did in the bedroom where the water was and from the drains, they'd have nothing to test. Okay, you don't know if there were um, paper towels with, uh, that had wiped up vomit and were inside that garbage can? I do not know. You don't know if there were, um, if there was mucus on the Kleenexes in that garbage can? I do not know. You don't know if there was um, any any spit, any type of fluid poured in those garbage cans that have been mopped up? I do not know. Uh, 
I don't have any pictures. I, I'm not sure there are from the, the garage, but we saw it in the walkthrough yesterday, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, did you take pictures of all the items in the garage? You mean 35 millimeter camera photos? Well, I guess any pictures aside from the, uh, the video camera pictures that you took, the moving pictures. I, I don't think we did. You didn't take any chemicals from the garage, did no, you? No, we did not. And you weren't actually looking for antifreeze? We were not, no. Do you agree that, um, that from the video it appeared that there might have been antifreeze in the garage? That is possible. And when you say antifreeze, I did notice in the video as I looked at it, there are some gallon-type containers on the shelf on the south side of the garage next to Mr. Jensen's vehicle, and those could have possibly had antifreeze in there, yes. That, that's where all those long shelves were, right? Correct. That's where basically anything that was stored in that garage was. That was It was along that wall. Yes. Okay, and that's where... Uh, you recognize bottles consistent with antifreeze. Correct. I also recovered some uh, Playboy magazines from that area as, as depicted in the video. You took, so, the, you took Playboy magazines. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you interrupted me. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I thought you were done. I'm sorry. Okay, no. I, I uh, took the Playboy magazines that were on the shelf, so I did do a visual check of the garage and of those shelves, but as you pointed out, at the time, I wasn't necessarily looking for antifreeze. In fact, that would have been pretty far-fetched. So I, I did inspect that area. I did recover uh, Playboy magazines, and those are still in evidence at the police department. So I did visually inspect that area and the garage, as I pointed out, in the garbage and so forth. I videotaped that. Uh, however, I did not recognize that there was antifreeze on those shelves. Kind of like the refrigerator um Aside from just an image of it, uh, there is no inventory of it. That is correct, yes. Okay. And you took the Playboy magazines, but you didn't take the, the bottles of chemicals. That is correct, yes. And nothing from the garage was fingerprinted? No. In the kitchen, you didn't take any chemicals either, right? Other than the garbage, uh, the only thing we took from the kitchen was the bag of garbage. No cleaning supplies? No. <clears throat> the next day, December 4th, uh, you attended the autopsy. Yes. And you were there with, uh, with Dr. Chambliss. I was. <clears throat> Dr. Chambliss was not on the scene. He was not. And you were the one that took the photographs at the autopsy? Most of them, yes. Now, the autopsy report that we, um, that we all saw said that it started at 2.25 p.m. Does that um, sound familiar? That, that very well could be correct, yes. Remember how long it took? I do not. Um, if Dr. Chambliss had said that it took about maybe up to two hours, does that sound um, consistent with how long an autopsy would have taken? It, it, it does, thank you, yes. Had you been to autopsies before? Many. Okay, and is two hours a reasonable amount of time? Yes, it is. All right, and when an autopsy gets done, um, do you just immediately head out the door? No, uh, not, not necessarily. It just depends on the circumstances. Sometimes at an autopsy, uh, I, I, in past uh, autopsies, I've collected evidence. So uh, maybe I'll let the doctor take care of that. Maybe he wants to turn something over to me, or if I want to turn over something to him, that's usually when we meet. Uh, kind of call it a pre-meeting and then a post-meeting, uh, pun intended. <clears throat> I haven't seen, and I'm, I want to know, were there any um, pictures that you took at the autopsy before incisions were made? Well, I didn't uh, take any. I took photos at the autopsy. However, uh, I didn't uh, retain the film. Uh, when the autopsy was going on on December 4th, 1998, uh, Dr. Chamless had a camera, and at some point he got dirty uh, 
if you will, and I operated the camera for him and took the photos, and then he retained the roll of film that I took the photos with. So I did take the photos with Dr. Chambliss's camera. However, I didn't uh, retain the film. Have you reviewed the pictures? I've seen one. Okay. Um, so it's your memory that Dr. Chambliss took some pictures and you took some? For the most part, I took photos, but uh, Dr. Chambliss uh, may have taken a couple also. And just to be clear, it's your testimony that Dr. Chambliss retained the film? Correct, yes. <coughs> now, on December 3rd, 1998, at the, at the scene, you, of course, you observed uh, Julie Jensen's body. I did. And, um, and you testified earlier that prior to today, I guess, you reviewed your reports in this case. Correct. And nothing unusual about Julie Jensen's body was noted in your reports, correct? When you say reports, uh, I think what you, it, the photos that I took are part of my report. So I obviously have that part of my report and what I pointed out in those photos were the concerns and something that I found unusual was the bent nose and the uh, blood or petechia in both eyes. Uh, so I did document that in my report I think what you're referring to possibly is my narrative. I didn't put that necessarily in my narrative. However, I documented it through photographs. Sure. You have the photographs, and you can look at those now, and, and you can say um, those are items of concern, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. In your narrative report, you mentioned nothing about uh, Julie Jensen's nose. I believe that is correct, yes. Okay. Um, and in your narrative report, you were describing items of interest at the scene, correct? Correct. <clears throat> Do you remember taking any photos at the autopsy of Julie Jensen's nose as it appeared on December 4th? I don't recall specifically. Now, the autopsy, if, if we ballpark it as lasting um, a couple of hours. Yes. That takes us to 4.30ish, right? Correct on December 4th, 1998? Correct, yes. Okay. Would it be reasonable that within half an hour of it being done, you were, you were out of there? Yes. Okay. So 5 o'clock, you would have left. Um, do you remember where the autopsy was? It was at the old St. Catharines, uh, located on Sheridan Road near 7th Avenue in the city of Kenosha. How far away is that from the Pleasant Prairie address where the uh, Jensen family lived? It's probably, a, if you take Sheridan Road right down there, it's probably a 15-minute uh, drive from St. Catharines to the village of Pleasant Prairie. Now, on December 3rd, after Mr. Jensen gave you consent to search his home, yes, uh, he then didn't stay there, right? He did not. Okay, and I think you mentioned that um, uh, his father came and got some clothes for him. No, in the, in the video, I actually misspoke. Uh, I called it Dan Jensen. That was actually, if in the video, uh, I say Dan Jensen when, in fact, it is Mark Jensen that came over. I had contact with him. Okay. And in the video, uh, I say Dan Jensen, and that wasn't corrected until now. However, I meant Mark Jensen came over. Uh, Dan Jensen wouldn't know where those personal items were, and Mark obviously did, and he collected them to stay overnight at his father's home who lived uh, down the road on Lakeshore Drive also. And uh, so I misspoke on the video. That is actually Mark Jensen coming in to recover those items for his overnight stay at his parents' house. Oh, thanks for clarifying that. Thank you. Um, so it was Mr. Jensen, Mark Jensen, that came and got his clothes, came and got his uh, shaving kit, right? Correct, yes. Okay. And when he left, he had basically turned the house over to with the consent, had turned the house over to you and investigators, correct? That is correct, yes. All right. And at that point, uh, fair to say he wasn't um, really allowed, no one else was allowed to just come and go as they pleased? That is correct, yes. Okay. And it was kind of with that consent, that cooperation was understanding that um, the full scene had been, like, 
is relinquished the right word? I'm sorry, what was your last part of the question? I didn't hear you. That the whole house had been basically relinquished to you. Yes, uh, the house was uh, in our charge. It was a crime scene and uh, a potential crime scene, but part of a death investigation. And the entire property was uh, uh, in my custody in the police department to obtain evidence. Okay, now you left, or at least the video, um, I thought, ended around uh, 10 p.m. on the 3rd? That is correct, yes. Okay, and uh, did anyone stay there overnight? Uh, the police officers, I had the uh, entire home. It was a uh, secure site, so there was a log started with who came and went, and uh, the officer, I had an officer guarding the house until I released it uh, later on December 4th. <coughs> was it just one officer that was there at all times? There were different officers, but only one officer. Okay. Um, now, after the autopsy, and if you left at 5 o'clock, and maybe it takes 15 minutes, did you go directly to the Jensen home? I did. Okay. And you went there because you were going to do another search, right? Yes. And you were, in particular, you were looking for um, fluids in the house, correct? Correct. Like bodily fluids? Correct. Okay. And you were checking the bed in particular? Yes, while I was at the autopsy, uh, I was there with Dr. Chambliss. He conducted the autopsy, and Dr. Uh, I explained to Dr. Chambliss that we didn't find any uh, fluids in the carpet or in the bed, and then he wanted me to go there and double check to make sure there weren't any uh, fluids on the sheets, on the pillowcases, or on the blanket. And obviously, Julie Jensen had her clothing with her, so if there were any fluids, he already had that. Okay. So what I did is I went back December 4th to re-examine uh, the bedroom, and I didn't find any other additional uh, body fluids. Okay, and additional, you never found any bodily fluids? That is correct, yes. So like um, on December 3rd or December 4th, you didn't find any fluids on the pillowcase? That is correct, yes. Okay, and um, with where her face was, there was, the pillowcase seemed just normal dry? Correct, yes. Okay, did you, I mean, you, we saw you testing by picking up with your hands the uh, towels in the bathroom, and you say this towel's damp or it's, or it's not damp. Did you do that with, um, with the pillowcase? I did. In fact, if you, you don't have the photos here, but you notice a couple close-up uh, photos of some marks on the uh, uh, pillowcase. I suspected at first, at first glance, I thought it was blood, and you notice a, a wide angle, and then you notice that I come in and you notice my finger pointing that out. When I first saw it, I thought it was a body fluid and possibly blood. So uh, that's how thoroughly I examined uh, the bed at that point. And it, it turned out it was just some markings or part of the uh, uh, fabric and it's all part of the Part of the pattern on the sheets, right? Better said, sir, yes. Yeah. Better said, sir. Yeah, it, it yes. was like a little berries on um, a branch or something, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. No blood was on the pillowcase? That is correct, yes. No sort of uh, spit up? No. Okay. Uh, and you went and you double checked all the bed sheets and you were looking for any, any bodily fluids? That is correct, yes. Okay. No urine? No. No feces? No. Okay. Just normal bed sheets yes okay <clears throat> did that search take about an hour probably less than an hour but an hour would be a good approximation okay um, so that takes us to maybe uh, 615 if you were being real efficient yes were there other officers at the scene while you were doing the search uh, they were uh, outside. Uh, the officers guarding the place was. Uh, they stayed outside, and I entered the house by myself. Okay. <clears throat> now, also on December 4th, you went and talked with the next-door neighbors. I did. Okay. Was that after you'd done the search? Correct. That was as I was leaving the uh, residence. So I've got the chronology right. Autopsy, drive to the Jensen home, search for an hour, then go and talk with the neighbors? Yes. 
And how long did you talk with the neighbors? Oh, it was probably, a, boy, I don't know, a 10 minute, 15 minute conversation at most. Okay. And, and again, I'm, I'm really estimating it. It was back in 98 also, so yes. This is just from memory? Yes. Um, well, no, there's some notation in my narrative report on my discussion with Mr. Voigt. And in the narrative report, it's kind of a lengthy uh, description of that discussion, isn't it? That is. Okay, and you think 15 minutes is a fair approximation for that lengthy I, of a narrative? It could be more, it could be less. That's, that's an approximate. All right. Um, it was all after this that you turned the house back over to Mark Jensen? Correct. That evening? Yes. And did you call him on the phone? I did. Okay. And do you remember how quickly he came over? I wasn't there when he came over. I returned to the police department. I called Mr. Jensen. Mr. Jensen was kind enough to uh, give us a key also. So I wanted to make sure he got his key back and that he could re-enter and use the, the residence uh, in the evening of December 4th, 1998. Did you meet him at his house? I did not. Was another officer there? Correct. Okay. So officers were there when the house was turned back over to Mr. Jensen? Correct. Okay. And, um, and, and I, I told them to make sure they give the key back to Mr. Jensen when he arrived. Okay. So any, um, any sort of handoff back of the, of the property would not have been done by just um, him showing up and the house being empty? Correct. Okay. There would have been like tape being taken down or and then squad cars leaving, all of that. Well, back in 98, that uh, tape that you commonly see now wasn't that popular, and we, we didn't use that out there. We didn't want to, uh, anyway, you, you mentioned taped, and we, we didn't use that. But uh, I made arrangements for Mr. Jensen to return home and made sure the officer was there to hand the key off back to him. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the computer from the den. Yes. <coughs> you took this, uh, the CPU, on December 3rd, um, right away, right? Yes. Okay, and you put it in the trunk of your car? I actually put it in the back seat. Uh, back then, uh, well, I know it was a very expensive thing back in 98, uh, but yes, I put it in the back seat of my vehicle. Okay, and from your vehicle, it went to your office? Correct. All right. And it stayed in your custody until December 17th, 1998, right? That is correct. Okay, and you testified yesterday about with the chain of custody of then taking it to um, to Brad Holler in Madison. That is correct, yes. And you would have turned it over to him? Yes. Now, you drove it there on December 17th. That is correct, yes. And, um, and I want to ask you about the examination that was done on December 17th. Yes. Um, Brad Haller, uh, it's my understanding, did not have time to examine it when you got there. Well, what, what occurred was I made arrangements. I, 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 I would, I'll ask for follow-up, but I guess right now I'd just like to kind of do the yes or no. Is that, is that at least um, accurate in terms of what I asked? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand how you want me to answer. Well, just um, if possible, yes or no. Um, did he have time when you got there to examine the computer? No, he didn't. Okay. And you um, had just driven from Kenosha or from Pleasant Prairie, right? That is correct. I called him up ahead of time to make arrangements and... Uh, I drove to Madison with the computer. You had scheduled an appointment with him? I did. And uh, he said he didn't have time to do it? He did. Say that he did not have time to do it after I made those arrangements and then I drove to Madison. That is correct. Okay. And you insisted that you wanted to do a look at the computer? Yes, I explained to Mr. Haller that I wanted to look at the computer. That's why I called ahead and made the arrangements uh, because I noted, uh, looking over the evidence from the Jensen home, that uh, 
they obviously had quite a bit of written documentation and we went, went over some of that yesterday and I wanted to look inside the computer and see if there was anything in the document Senate uh, section of the computer so uh, it was a death investigation it was December 17th now I had no cause of death and you know there were some circumstances around this case and there were some people very hurt and very concerned and I wanted to try to obtain a uh, cause of death ASAP and I didn't have one and I was hoping the computer would uh, aid in that and I was looking for as I mentioned earlier the uh, uh, information that I had from Mr. Jensen, uh, Mrs. Jensen, I looked over the evidence. There was a lot of documents. I wanted to see what was on the computer and if there was anything like in a Word document as we know of today. I'm not sure Word was available in 98, but I wanted to see if there was some written communication on that computer. And I explained to Mr. Haller, look, I called ahead of time. I drove here two hours. This is over half my day just coming here and back. And the arrangement was is to look on there and do a cursory look to see if there's any documents on that computer that relate to the death of Julie Jensen. Fair to say you were irritated. Yes, yes. Uh, December 17th, um, do you remember what the weather was? I think it was... Uh, a nice day. Uh, it was sunny. It, 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 there was definitely not a snowstorm, uh, but uh, well, that's good uh, at least. Yes. <laughs> okay. But, so, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I I recall it being sunny, and uh, the reason I recall that is uh, it, at that time their office was down in the square in Madison, and uh, it, it was I had to park some distance away. As you know, parking is very challenging there, and I can recall walking with a nice, bright, sunny day. Twenty-four years later you still sound irritated about um, driving there and him saying he didn't have time to look at it. Well, I, I wouldn't use the word irritated, uh, c concerned, because this, this was a priority case <laughs> for us at the police department, uh, given the history here, and uh, I wasn't able to rule out uh, uh, natural death, accidental death, homicide, suicide. I wasn't able to rule anything that out, and yeah, maybe you are rather correct that I was irritated at the time, but I wasn't uh, getting any progress and I wanted things to move along quicker. You and so I was a little uh, irritated. I, I stepped back and I, I agree with you. You didn't want to leave without looking at this computer. That is correct, yes. Okay, and you insisted that he turn it on. I did. All right, now <clears throat> you pressured him to turn it on. I did. I was, I was very insistent. I said, hey, look, uh, I just went through my, my reasons, and I explained those reasons to Mr. Haller, and I need to look at this uh, computer. This is a death investigation. And so he, uh, he acquiesced? He agreed? He did. He, uh, yeah, I, I had no clue on how, how to fire it up, hook it up. He had all those resources there. I also remember being that it was a Windows 98, which was... Uh, this was 98, so this was new whiz-bang computer software for its time. I had no clue what Windows 98 was. And uh, he assisted and hooked it up, and uh, he guided around with me and looking at the computer, and my particular concern was what written uh, documents were on that computer. Now, there's a reason you didn't fire it up from December 3rd to December 17th in your office, right? Yes. Okay. And that's because of the whole thing we talked about with preserving evidence. Correct. Yes. Right? Yes. That, um, that with computers, you don't um, turn it on and just start poking around, right? That is, yes, I, I know better now. Yes. Yeah. And arguably you knew better then, right? Well, no, that was the first computer I have ever obtained. Uh, computers were just making their debut, if you would in uh, 1998. Windows uh, 98 was the top-notch software of the time. Uh, no, uh, my computer skills were uh, zero and minus. So, uh, uh, no, I wouldn't have... Uh, you hadn't had any training on how to preserve computer evidence at a, at a scene? Yeah, we had some limited training at that time, uh, but uh, my training would have been... Uh, I, w I had very little training and frankly uh, did, did, did not know. And if you had learned that, it, I guess it hadn't stuck, right? 
Well, I, I, I obtained a computer, I unplugged it and all that. In fact, I can recall when we uh, uh, seized the computer, we kind of had a conference around it uh, to make sure no, knowing what we do. I do recall uh, back then dial-up was the technology. I can recall a phone cord or something going into it and we didn't know if we were gonna disconnect the Jensen phone system or something like that. So our knowledge on, uh, or my knowledge at least, on gathering that computer was very limited. But I did uh, obtain it and uh, bring it to the crime lab, as you mentioned, on uh, December 17th, 1998. Okay, and the reason why it's a bad idea to just fire it up, right, is because mm -hmm. it alters the information or can alter information on that computer, right? Objection, so, there's no foundation for this witness to answer that sustained. question. <clears throat> Do you know uh, from your training why it's a bad idea to fire up a computer um, like the way you did? Well, object, I object to that question. It assumes the existence of fact, not an evidence, to wit that it is a bad idea. Um, well, he did say he knows better now. Well, I think he already testified he had very limited knowledge. He's not an expert in the area, so the objection is going to be sustained. Do you know if... I mean, the, we're going to have other people testify later. You can ask your question then. Do you know if the computer had been right blocked? When? Prior to insisting that Brad Haller and you turn on the computer. Oh, no, I don't believe the computer was right blocked. Uh, uh, that would be a question for Mr. Haller. And can you spell right blocked? No. Is it? Uh, you can't. No, I, I mean, I, I could guess at right and then block, but I don't know that that's the, no, I can't. And do you know what right blocking is? I, I do now. And what is it? That's uh, when you take a computer now into the crime lab, at least this was before 2012, uh, the crime lab does something what they call right block. And what that does is uh, secure the data on the computer and they can still retrieve it as if nobody turned it on as example I did. So, and they'll be able to determine that. Okay, uh, regardless, um, you you just had him turn it on yes and you poked around in it for how long 10 minutes uh, and again i'm approximating now mark jensen's work computer you made no effort to obtain his work computer in december of 1998 no i did not when, when you say his work computer at Stiffel, Nicholas, and Racine? Yes. No, I did not. You didn't obtain it until 2002, correct? Yes. And it was in 2002 that you took two computers from his, I guess at the time, current office, and an old work computer that was located in St. Louis, right? That is correct. Okay. So... Three years had gone by prior to um, trying to get those computers, right? Correct, yes. <coughs> In December of 1998, you didn't go to his office and interview any of his coworkers? I did not, no. And you didn't talk in December of 1998 with any of those coworkers about whether he was in the office on December 3rd? Correct. You didn't do that until after he was charged in 2002? Correct. And in those three years, this is a case that had been, uh, this is a story that had been reported in the media. In what year again, sir? between 1998 and 2002? I don't believe there was much media attention on there uh, between that. Uh, the, the media attention started after I arrested uh, Mark in 2002. Okay. Well, it would have been well known, I guess, among his coworkers, wouldn't you say that, um, that Julie Jensen had, had died in December of 1998? Objection, Objection calls for speculation for what uh, was going on with respect to 
<coughs> Would you expect memories to have improved in three years, in four years? No. I guess my math is wrong. 1998 to 2002, um, four years, right? Oh, I'll, well, you know, I'll, the state will stipulate that from a particular point in 1998 to a particular point in 2002, that would be four years. But from December 3rd, 1998 to March of 2002 is not four years. You could have, so the state objects to the question. You could have gotten a lot greater detail in the month of December 1998 by talking with witnesses than in 2002, correct? Objection calls for speculation. I think he can answer that question. He's the lead detective, go ahead. I'm sorry, would you repeat your question, Mr. Perry? It's likely you could have gotten greater detail in December of 1998, about December 1998, than in 2002, correct? Correct, yes. Okay, I mean, we, we testified at the, you testified at the very start of this today that um, that memories can be affected by the passage of time yes by talking with other witnesses correct or by other people just chatting amongst friends yes gossip yes reading reports yes okay and three to four years um, is a lot of time for that to happen right yes okay and these are uh, Mark Jensen's co-workers that I'm talking about that is correct, so yes. They, they would have known something about his situation. They, they did know, yes. <clears throat> you interviewed the Voights on December 4th. I spoke with them. When, when, when you say interview, do you mean a written statement or well, you just did a, I you, talked to them? You talked just maybe 15 minutes ago about kind of a lengthy narrative in your summary report about the um, discussion you had with them on December 4th. Yeah, when you say the Voights, uh, which Voight do you mean in particular? Either of them. Okay, I only spoke to uh, Mr. Voight on uh, December 4th, 1998. And you spoke with Carrie Ashley in December of 1998. I spoke with Carrie Ashley. I don't recall an exact date on speaking with her. Okay. Did you speak with any other of the Jensen neighbors in December of 1998? No. No. The consent that you got from Mark Jensen on December 3rd, it wasn't just consent to search his house, was it? No, it wasn't. It was pretty broad. Well, I got a consent, uh, well, pr pr pretty broad, meaning, yeah, it was pretty broad. I could search everything in there. I also obtained a, a form for him for any medical records of himself and Julie Jensen. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty broad. Yeah, it was, it was basically... Um, Things were an open book to you. Well, you know, I think I, I think that's probably overstated. I mean, I uh, intended to search the property at 9020 Lakeshore Drive, and that's what I did. I explained that to Mr. Jensen uh, previously. That uh, uh, when, when you say broad, that didn't mean I could go search the neighbors or out in the street or anything like that. Well, those but I got consent to, to search the entire property that uh, he maintained, and I also uh, obtained a. Uh, consent to uh, obtain any medical records of Julie Jensen and Mark Jensen. Mark Jensen's medical records, you, he gave you consent for? That is correct, yes. I mean, obviously he couldn't have given you consent to search the neighbor's homes, right? Correct. The things that he, uh, that were in his possession or his control, he gave you consent to search and seize whatever you deemed important? Correct, yes. Okay, in, including Pretty personal medical records. Correct, yes. <clears throat> now, you never um, attempted to obtain uh, Julie Jensen's, or maybe you attempted, I don't know if you did or not. Did you ever attempt to obtain Julie Jensen's uh, records from a Mr. DeFazio? Yes. Did you obtain them? No. And who is Mr. DeFazio? 
Mr. DeFazio was a, uh, and I don't know the technical term, but uh, the Jensen saw Mr. DeFazio for some marriage counseling. He's a psychotherapist, isn't he? I don't know. And you didn't get any records from him? I did not, no. Well, let, 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 let me be clear on that. I attempted to gain information from Dr. DeFazio, and I did call and stop by his office and speak with him. Uh, his office was also located over near uh, St. Catharines, and uh, I spoke with Mr. DeFazio, and he could not recall the Jensen's in treating them uh, for the marriage counseling. He didn't know who I was talking about. He couldn't remember. And he was under the impression that his records, it was so long ago, that those records would have been purged. So I did communicate with Dr. DeFazio, attempting to obtain those records. However, I was unsuccessful. Okay. In all the years since 1998, have you looked at, um, have you ever looked at or obtained uh, Mr. DeFazio's records for treating Julie Jensen? I have not obtained them, but I know uh, the district attorney's office, I believe, obtained them. I have not seen any, but I'm aware of that the district attorney uh, had got better results than I did. There was a 911 call on December 3rd, right? That is correct, yes. Yeah, and it was uh, Mark Jensen had called 911 to report Julie's condition. Correct, yes. To request assistance to the house. Yes, he called for the rescue squad. Now. All 911 calls, even in 1998, were recorded, right? I don't know. You just don't remember? I, well, yeah. I, I don't recall that's back in 98. And uh, they, were likely, uh, they were likely recorded, yes. Okay. Uh, regardless, it wasn't saved in this case, was it? That I don't know. Have you ever listened to the 911 call in this case? I have not. So you've never heard um, exactly what was first said uh, about from Mark Jensen on when he found Julie Jensen? Objection, Your Honor. This is all hearsay. I so, really asked what he has I, never heard. He said he never heard it. Yeah. So let's move on. At some point in... Well, really just a few days after Julie Jensen had died, on December 6th, 1998, you put a GPS unit on Mark Jensen's car. I did, yes. On his truck? You know, I wasn't there. Uh, I invited Mark Jensen, or he was stopping out at the police department. I had frequent contact with Mr. Jensen. And as Mr. Jensen would come to the police department, uh, I, through DCI, Department of Criminal Investigation, I teamed up with some of their agents, and I put a GPS tracker on his vehicle. I don't know what type of vehicle he was operating at the time. Uh, the DCI agents took care of putting a, a tracking device on Mr. Jensen's vehicle, and then later on they would remove it. Okay. <coughs> How long was there a GPS tracker on Mr. Jensen's vehicle? Uh, for some time. I don't recall the exact length. And nothing was ever found of value to you? Correct, yes. Okay, and this was done in a way where he wouldn't have, um, you did this in a way so that he wouldn't know that there's a GPS tracker on his vehicle. Yes, absolutely, yes. I wanna talk about the interrogation that we watched some of yesterday. Yes. That was on April 21st of 1999, right? Correct, yes. Now, you just got done explaining that you had been meeting with Mark Jensen on a regular basis. Weekly, I would say, either by phone call or by in person. And in person, was that at the uh, police station? Yes, it always was, uh, because I wanted to make sure we could recover the tracker or put the tracker on his vehicle. And how did that work? Did you um, ask him on these weekly phone calls or something to stop in? Well, generally, uh, Mr. Jensen would contact me primarily, and uh, we would make the arrangements, and he'd stop in or by the police department. He wasn't required to make weekly contact with you? No, he was, uh, he was uh, concerned. Okay. And he checked in with you regularly? He did, yes. Okay. And did you just invite him in? Yes. 
Okay, and then he'd, he'd take you up on that? Yes. And how long would those meetings last? Not very long, uh, probably, yeah, not very long. Can you ballpark it for me? Uh, less than 15 minutes. Okay, and th would these be like on his way to work? Sometimes. Okay, so he, it wouldn't be unusual for him to show up in a suit and tie? Yes, yes. Yes, it would not be unusual? No, he uh, generally was on his way to work or uh, maybe possibly on the way back, but uh, yes, that would be accurate. Okay, would he normally stop by? Would he have any of his kids in tow? Not, I, I don't recall. I know on uh, April 21st when he uh, came to the police department, he had uh, his one son with him. <coughs> that wasn't the first time you had met his son. Or was I, it? I don't recall meeting his son previously, but I might have. But uh, I, uh, I didn't have a conversation with his son in, of any substance until April 21st, 1998. All right, and you had um, purposefully tried to establish uh, an apparent friendship with Mark Jensen. Oh, well, we I, I was certainly uh, cordial uh, and uh, pro professional with Mr. Jensen. We had a very good uh, relationship. Uh, we we uh, <coughs> talked about the stock market, about his case, many, many things. So. Yeah, we, we, I guess you would be accurate. Uh, we developed a friendship, yes. You wanted him to be reaching out to you on a regular basis. That, that was convenient for as part of my investigation, yes. Now, on April 21st, you knew that this was going to be a different kind of meeting. Yes, yes, I did. But you didn't communicate that to Mark Jensen, did you? No, I did not. Okay. As far as he knew, this was like any of the other dozens of meetings he had had with you? That's accurate. Um, and so he might have been on his way to work? I don't know. I mean, you saw him in the video, and I don't know if you remember specifically, but he was in a suit and tie. He was. And I think uh, your testimony is that this started at 9 a.m. Correct. And he had, um, he had David with him, right? Yes. Okay. Um, fair to say he would have had no reason from you to believe that he would be there until 4 p.m. that day. Yes. That's fair? That, that, that is, yes. Okay. I didn't think it would go that long, so I'm sure Mr. Jens, Jensen didn't. Okay. And um, at no point did you say, hey, this is going to take all day? No. No. Uh, I wouldn't have forecasted that in, in regardless. I never thought we uh, we started at uh, nine. No, well, he got there early, so it was about nine o'clock, and we didn't end till probably four p.m. in our discussions. And um, with the exception of, uh, I think you testified yesterday that there was maybe an hour and a half um, video that failed. Was the whole nine to four recorded? Yes, uh, what I did was that the interview rooms at that time at Pleasant Prairie, we had a one-way mirror on the one. And again, keep in mind, this is 1998, and we had an old clunker uh, VCR that we would put on your shoulder. So I set it up and put that on a tripod in the adjoining uh, room, and then through the one-way mirror, and then I had this big uh, VHS video recorder set up on the tripod, and then I ran a microphone above the false ceiling into there, and then, uh, because I, I wanted to capture everything that Mark Jensen was going to say. And so that's why I did that. Uh, recording interviews back in 98 was pretty uncommon, especially video interviews. So, and the technology was a lot different than it was today. So I had that VHS, and I put in one tape, and Detective uh, Berg, who you saw in the video, was operating the tape in my office or monitoring it where the recording device was. Where and then Dave? at some point, the, uh, uh, I took a break or came in and replayed the tape, and we discovered it wasn't recording. So we swapped out the tapes. There's a total of three tapes, and one of the tapes failed. Uh, and why it did, I don't know. I think it was defective out of the box. But there, the interview that I had with Mr. Jensen, uh, there's probably a good hour that is not on VHS tape. Where was David Jensen during this interview? 
Uh, he stayed with one of our uh, support staff at the police department. And was Mark uh, permitted throughout this um, seven hours uh, to go and check on his son? I'm sure he inquired. Uh, Mr. Jensen and I, I bought him lunch. We had, I think it was Burger King. Uh, we had some soda. We had coffee. Uh, we uh, ate lunch together. Uh, we drank refreshments together. And I'm sure during that, uh, that would have been a concern to me. Uh, however, uh, the one secretary that was in charge of uh, uh, his son was uh, uh, v very kind. And I think his son and the secretary hit it off and he was uh, uh, occupied while I interviewed Mr. Jensen. I'm not suggesting that David Jensen is mistreated. I'm just asking if, um, if in those seven hours, if uh, he was permitted to go and check on his son. If he wanted, I don't recall that, but if he wanted to, I would have certainly honored his uh, request. You didn't offer it? I don't believe so, no. And, and when you went and got lunch, it wasn't lunch with uh, Mark and with his son, David? It was not, no. Okay. No. <clears throat> now, at the time that... Um, you had Mark come in on this day. I mean, you, you testified you, you prepared for this interview, right? This interrogation? I, I did. I mean, I, I made some arrangements. I set up the VHS recorder and I ran the microphone. We tested the equipment beforehand and uh, I, I gathered the reports and the information that uh, I wanted to cover with Mr. Jensen. You hadn't done that for any of the other meetings that you'd ever had with Mr. Jensen? Well, we discussed reports, uh, Mr. Jensen. I mean the VHS, the camcorder, all of those things. I'm sorry. Yes. No, no. That was our first recorded uh, interview. Okay. And this is the first one that was not just brief. Yes. And uh, the room that you were meeting with him in, that's not where you'd typically meet with him? Correct. Yes. Would you typically meet with him just in your office or in the lobby? I'm sorry. Would, would you, you repeat that? Would you typically meet with him in your office? I would typically, when we met at the police department, there was a little conference room off the lobby. I would meet them in there. On April 21st, you were under the, at that time, um, misimpression that antifreeze had been ruled out, right? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, you believe that, uh, the way I said that, I don't want to have it be confusing. Um, you believed that antifreeze had been ruled out on April 21st? Correct, yes. Okay. And your plan was to confront Mark Jensen and to try to get him to confess to playing a part in Julie Jensen's death? So, could, could, could you repeat that one more time, sure. sir? Your plan on April 21st was to confront Mark Jensen and to try to get him to confess to playing a part in Julie Jensen's death? Yes, that, that is correct, yes. And you testified about this yesterday that you lied to him multiple times in the interview. I did, yes. And you lied about the crime lab determining that he had left photos? Well, I think my statement was is uh, I lied to him about the writing on the photos that were left around the Jensen home and that I had a crime lab report about his handwriting being on them. I mean, you, you lied about the crime lab even analyzing the photos. That is correct, yes. So the crime lab never analyzed the photos. I think eventually they, they did, uh, however, uh, not while I spoke with Mr. Jensen. Well, only one photo was ever retained, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. Um, and the rest were just lost to the ages, right? No, no. That, uh, the other photos, and they were primarily uh, recovered by Mr. Uh, or Officer Cosman, and uh, there, there was no real complaint on this. We were down there, as we pointed out, from 1992 until 2008, and we recovered some of those photographs. Our evidence room is in all that. 2008 day. or 1998? I'm sorry, sir. You said until 2008? No, no. Let, let, let. Is there an objection? I object. Well, the, the, the response, it was non-responsive, Your Honor. I guess I object on that point. Okay. This is your witness. He's talking. Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead, uh, finish. Yeah, uh, and, and so, some, since we didn't have a complaining witness at the time and we collected them and we cleared Terry Perica and there was no charges being pressed, I wasn't in charge of the evidence and how it was disposed of, but
but eventually that evidence is uh, to keep room in the evidence collection. So there, there was nothing purposeful about, uh, uh, well, I, I guess there was a purpose to destroying them, but it was considered obsolete evidence. They're gone. They are, absolutely, yes. Yeah. They're gone and they were never tested. Correct. You did um, a few other things during this uh, interrogation, right, in terms of um, tactics with Mr. Jensen? Uh, yes. Um, you talked about how you lied to him. Correct, yes. Uh, you did something where you you engaged in something called persistent questioning. Yes. You spoke over Mr. Jensen at times. At times. Yeah, you would interrupt him. Correct, yes. Yeah, and the plan with these things, with these things that you were doing, was to uh, put pressure on him in that interview, fair? Yes, I was uh, intending to put pressure on him for, for him to tell me the truth. And the, the, the truth is, is you were determining it. it. It could be viewed that way. You were trying to make it easy for Mr. Jensen to tell you what you wanted to hear. Well, I wanted the, the truth. I didn't want to uh, uh, impose on him. And there was uh, uh, to say that it's something that I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear the truth. And I wanted him to tell me the truth. And I knew he was lying to me during the interview. <laughs> Now, the interrogation was from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., correct? Approximately, yes. And we saw, um, I mean, it was, it was in sort of chopped up segments yesterday, right? Correct. We saw about 45 minutes worth of that. Okay, yes. That seems, that seems fair? Fair, seems fair, yes. It took a lot longer yesterday than 45 minutes. Probably. <laughs> because of the stopping and reading what we had just watched, right? Yes. Uh, we saw a few different segments of the, of the interview. Um, let me just grab the transcript of it. Are we good yet? We need a break yet? You want to take a break? No? Yes? No? We're good. We're good. All right. We'll continue. It looks like you have someone in the back row who would like to take a break. I think you have a mixed... Um, a mixed bag. You have, you have a mixed I'll bag. Uh, rule on the side of caution. Yeah. Take your break. <laughs> Try to... All right, we're in recess.
<clears throat> Been around the block a few times. Oh, I got stuff. <laughs> I'm shedding. <laughs> All right, we're back on the record. Mark Jensen, 2002 CF 314. Appearances are the same. The jury's back in the courtroom. We are going to continue with the cross examination. The witness is still under oath. We were just sort of talking really about the content of the interrogation that we saw yesterday, right? Correct, yes. You can hear me okay, right? I can, thank you. I'm trying to figure out a place to put all this stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> early on, one of the early clips we saw, you told... Um, Mark Jensen, that you had eliminated Perry Tarika as doing any of that stuff at your home. Correct, yes. And that was because at one point you talked to Perry Tarika and discovered that he was out of state, right? Correct. Okay. And that's why you believed he could not have been the person leaving photographs. Correct. Okay. Now, the harassment that, um, that Julie had complained of over the years, uh, it, while it did include photographs, right? Correct. It also uh, was heavily about phone calls to the house, correct? Yes, and I would, I would prefer that we use the term images as opposed to photographs because they weren't necessarily photographs, but uh, the term image would be a better description of what well, was, was left. There was one photograph that was um, that's in existence, correct? Correct, yes. One image? Yes. And that's printed on... Kodak paper, correct? I don't know. Okay. It, have you looked at it? Not recently. Okay. You don't know if it appears to be a photograph in that one instance at least? It does. It does appear to be a photograph? Yes. Okay. And the rest we, we don't have and we can't look at? Correct. <clears throat> I want to show you, you were shown this um, yesterday and it's... Uh, Exhibit S27, let me just grab it. What is exhibit? Council, what was it that you gave? What number is that for the record? S27. Thank you. It is S27 that I gave you, right? Correct, yes. Uh, what is S that? That is a copy of some Pleasant Prairie Police Department reports. You testified about this uh, yesterday, right? I did. You've reviewed this before? Yes. And 
page one uh, starts on January 27th of 1992. Yes. <clears throat> and the um, last report is December 18th, 1996, correct? Yes. And this is um, a compilation of the uh, police calls to the Jensen households between those years, correct? Yes. And it outlines, if you go one by one, it outlines um, what the different calls for service were, correct? Correct. And the responses? Sometimes. Okay. In the, in the interrogation yesterday that we saw in 1999, um, you talked about this uh, ongoing issue with um, the photographs, correct? Or the, the images, as you'd like to call them? Yes. Okay. And I just want to review a handful of these. Okay. I mean, there are not that many, really, right? Yes. Um, and if you could just page along with me, but uh, the first one, I guess if you look at, um, well, page one and two is January 27th, 1992, right? Correct, yes. Okay, and that just says suspicious activity. Yes. No other details, right? Yes. January 29th, 1992, suspicious problem, no other details. Yes. Fair? Yes. January 30th, 1992, gone for the weekend. Yes. February 20th, 1992, vacation times reported. Yes. In June 16th of 1992, there was a call because a car was parked across the street for too long. Yes. May 8th of 93, a belief that someone had entered the residence and moved items. Yes. November 4th, 93, there was a complaint about receiving annoying phone calls, hangups, and harassments. Yes. You see that one? Yes. Okay, and that's the first time that something was reported and it was reported about phone calls. Yes. Nothing about photographs reported in that complaint. Yes. November 4th, 1993, receiving annoying phone calls, hangups. No, I just read that one, didn't I? Um, sorry. October 21st, 1994, uh, Julie Jensen complaining that uh, there were black males in the neighborhood selling magazines. Yes. October 22nd, 94, um, a repeat of the same complaint. Yes. On Christmas of 94, their Christmas tree lights were damaged and they complained about that. Or she complained about that. She's the, um, she's the caller, right? Yes. January 19th of 1995, um, it just says, from what I can tell, there's nothing, right? Correct. Uh, it's, it's an extra patrol complaint. January 21st of 95, there's a trespass to land and there was a person that was cited, correct? Yes. May 27th of 95, uh, nothing seems to be noted except that um, uh, Perry Tarika is listed on that report. Are you talking about uh, 90, the dated uh, 527 95? Yes. 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 <clears throat> and then finally, on, and this isn't the last report in the, in the whole packet, but uh, I guess for the first time, and it's August 25th of 1995, um, there's a report about uh, photographs being found. 
Yes. And in that report, um, it indicates that they, uh, on April 25th, produced photos that had been found from July and earlier, correct? Yes. I want to make sure I said that right. On August 25th, it was reported that they had they had kind of collected photos from earlier and they were turning them over on the 25th. It makes reference to August 23rd, you're, you're correct, yes, sir. To July 3rd. So, okay, yes. Yeah? You're, you are correct, yes. Okay. From, I, I, yes. It's very possible I said it wrong. No. Um, we're good, thank you. Now, yesterday during the interrogation, You were asking Mark Jensen about finding photographs, correct? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. And he told you some of that stuff, and this is on page 52 of the transcript. Okay, thank you. He told you some of the stuff I would accumulate, and then I'd say I found it in the shed. I'd say I found it in the shed. He went on to say, and it would be a way of giving it to her without saying, I've been hanging on to this stuff basically. Yeah, I'm sorry. And it would be a way of giving it to her without saying, I've been hanging on to this stuff basically. I mean, but in terms of, I was not coming up with this stuff. And he went on. I mean, this falls into the same trap as the phone calls. I know that Julie told me at one point that everyone thought that I was making the phone calls, and yet we'd be sitting on the couch in the living room together. Question, a hum, and the phone would ring. Answer, and the phone would ring. I mean, it couldn't possibly, I'm sitting there with her, so she knew it wasn't me. There's a time when the pictures, I know. Question, so you misled her, which in turn misled the police? Answer, the police, yes. I mean, it was not a malicious standpoint, it was. And you characterized this yesterday as him acknowledging that he was the one leaving photographs, right? Yes. And what he actually told you is that they had accumulated and then he would show her, correct? Yes. And that's consistent with the report from August 25th of 1995 that you just read, right? I didn't read it completely, but uh, yes, I believe it's, it's consistent. That these photographs would accumulate and then they'd be turned over. Yes. Now you're also aware, we talked yesterday and we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, about um, Julie Jensen's log, right? Yes. That was her log of harassment? Correct. Yeah, and, and fair to say the vast majority of that is uh, detailing phone calls? Possibly, yes. That you'd agree with that? Yes. Um, and it does reference, though, this issue of um, pictures, correct? It does. And if you need to see it, that's fine. Just let me know. But um, uh, this is consistent with her discussing in that log um, accumulating things and turning it over to Officer Kosman. They talked about a garbage bag full of, of evidence, right? Correct. Okay. You remember seeing that? Yes. You testified yesterday that 
after Mark had explained that photos were received at the office, I want to make sure I said that right, that, that after Mark had said that photos had been received in the mail at the office, that you talked to support staff in his office who opened the mail and you determined that they had never experienced that, correct? In Mr. Jensen's interview, I said, would, would, would you? Yesterday testifying. Yes. Yes, yes, I did. I thought you were referring to the uh, video. I'm sorry, I was mistaken. But yes, you are correct. That's fair. I mean, I just, I guess, jumped from something that happened in 1999 to something that happened in 2023. Yes, I thought you were referring to the video again. But uh, yes, that was part of my investigation. I did speak with the uh, staff at uh, Mark Jensen's office. At which office did you speak to? Uh, the Racine office. Of uh, Stiffel? Yes. Now I'm going to ask you about the interrogation. Thank you. Council, I'm looking at page 51, lines 25 to 52. I mean, this was all read yesterday. Um, I'm sorry, Council, which lines? Lines 25 to page 52, line 4. <clears throat> this is Mark Jensen speaking at the beginning. He says, no, they were, the ones that were mailed to the office were early on in the first year or two. Question, a uh hum. Answer, that is when I was at, and it says unintelligible, in Milwaukee. That was when I got stuff in the mail. Do you remember that? I do. Did you speak to anyone at either the Prudential office or Baird office in Milwaukee? No. Um, you only spoke to the employees at Stiffel where Mark started working in 1998, correct? Correct. You mentioned earlier that the, um, well, there's the one photo that was, that was kept and the other pictures have been destroyed. Were correct. those ever fingerprinted? No. <laughs> you talked in the interview and in the interrogation about whether Mark Jensen wrote anything on, on these pictures, right? Correct, yes. You never asked him to identify anything he specifically wrote? Correct. He never said he created any of the photos. I don't believe so. He told you that his wife was upset by the photos? Yes. And that he was reluctant to tell her he had received one and then ultimately he would tell her or show her? Yes. I wanna clarify something from the interrogation yesterday. We were shown a clip where uh, Mr. Jensen denied there being any sexual violence or anything sexual, correct? Yes. Okay. And there's some necessary context to that. Five pages earlier, because you had, you had been suggesting different ideas you had of how Mark Jensen would have caused Julie Jensen's death, right? Yes. Okay. And you were just, again, like, like we talked about earlier today, you're trying to make it easy, you're trying to propose 
ways for Mark Jensen to confess to you. Yes. And so you were coming up with these theories, right? Yes. And five pages earlier, you had suggested to him that her death was an autoerotic death and that he and Julie were playing around sexually. Yes. Yes. Uh, are you reading that off the transcript? Well, I read it off the transcript, just not right now. I mean, if, if, are you, do you remember suggesting that to him? Yes, I do. Okay. And his response of um, there not being any sexual violence or anything sexually, uh, that's in context of you having proposed that to him. I would have to see the transcript. I, uh, but I recall seeing saying that, and uh, Mark and I had that uh, conversation. But it didn't come out of the blue. No, it did not. If if you had a copy of the transcript for me, I could be more uh, uh, efficient, if you will. I'm not sure what what this has been. You've marked this the portion. I'm just going to show. I have no objection to using that. I need this back, but this okay, is very good, sir. <clears throat> just reading the bottom of um, the highlighted part on the bottom of sixty-seven. What does that say? Okay, you would like me to read it? Yes. Please. Yes. Now, now, have you ever heard of erotic death or autoerotic death or something like that? And for the record, the number of the exhibit he was reading from. Well, for the record, he was reading from. Twenty-seven was the. I'll have to have it marked. This page. I'm doing that for the higher authorities. Um. <laughs> and we do have to make a good record. So that's all I'm trying to do. Somebody has to tell me. For the, what exhibit he was reading from. Sure, and it wasn't an exhibit because partial transcript was. All right. The whole transcript. I think we should print an entire copy of the uh, interview and mark it as an exhibit. And Whatever I, you wish I, to do. And I. But I'll do that. I'll do that over the lunch hour, and we'll have and then just this. remind us, and we'll put it into the record. Uh, the state has no objection to this method of examination, however, Your Mr. Honor. Right. Right. This is Exhibit Fifty Two that you just read from, right? Yes, it is. And that's page sixty-seven of the transcript of your interrogation. Yes. One of the latter segments that we watched yesterday was Mark Jensen describing Julie Jensen on the morning of December 3rd, correct? Yes. And he described that she was taking very deep breaths. Yes. That she sat up in bed with Mark's assistance. Yes. You asked, was she talking? He answered, hardly. Yes. Counsel, do you know which page of the transcript you're looking at? It wasn't. Page 89 to 94. Thank you. <coughs> he told you, I want to say she indicated that she was okay? Yes. And he also told you she took the other sleeping pills 
the other sleeping pill after the kids went to school. Yes. He was later asked, why would you roll her on her side while she's sleeping? Do you remember asking him that? Yes. And he answered, because she was having, you know, the baby thing with kids, you don't lay them flat on your back because if they cough like that. Yes. He told you he tried to feed her, she wouldn't eat, didn't drink water the last day. Now you're speaking of the transcript from yesterday, correct? That's right. Yes. Okay. It would be most helpful maybe if I had a transcript, but uh, uh, so I could be accurate. I'm not trying to be difficult. I just want to be accurate. So. No, I know. Uh, I'll grab what was submitted yesterday. This to refresh, see if that will refresh your memory. Very good, sir. This entire page. Yeah, hang on to this for right now. I'm okay. showing you um, the, sec the pages I'll ask you about were pages that were admitted yesterday. Right now you're on page 103, correct? Yes, it is. I am. <coughs> And that's the page where Mark Jensen told you that he rolled her on her side because of the baby thing with kids. You don't lay them flat on their back, right? Yes. On page 118 to 119, let me know when you're there. Yes. <clears throat> you want to read through those pages real quick just to yourself? Yes. He told you he tried to feed her, she wouldn't eat, didn't drink water that last day? Yes. She tried Thursday morning but choked on it, drinking, referring to water, right? Yes. <coughs> Do you want to take a look at 137 to 142? Yes. He described uh, that she had bad breathing on the morning of December 3rd. Yes. We heard a, uh, a small portion of uh, the uh, book that was read by you yesterday, right? Yes. You read out loud <clears throat> the words, I walked in the door and approaching the receptionist counter explained, Julie was here yesterday to see Dr. Borman. 
He gave her some samples last night. She woke, she woke me up acting drunk and blaming it on this. I said, showing her the printout. That's consistent with what he told you in the interrogation on April 21st, 1999, correct? Yes. Prior to this April 21st interrogation, you had received the autopsy report? Yes. The autopsy report didn't have any opinion or conclusion as to cause or manner of death, right? Yes. And you had, like we talked about earlier this morning, um, you were under the misimpression that ethylene glycol had been ruled out, correct? Yes. And we talked about with the, uh, the whole autoerotic death suggestion, you were trying to come up with a narrative that would explain uh, that, that Mark Jensen could agree to for you, right? Yes. In addition to your sexual violence proposal to him, you had another idea regarding asphyxiation, correct? I may have. I'm going to give you the transcript back so you can follow along so you can remember exactly, okay? Thank you. What page, what page are you going to, Council? Okay. <clears throat> if you can go to page 75 to 76. 75, starting at line 24. Page 75, line 24, sir. Yeah, and read um, to yourself to uh, line 3 on page 76, I think. Okay. You suggested to him, you said, her arm was actually here. I'll show you how she was, okay? Her arm is actually across her body like that, okay? And it's an unnatural position. Do you sleep on your, when you're on your side with your arm across like that? You asked him that, correct? Yes. I want you to go to page 98 to 99 now. 98 starting on line 25. Page 98, line 5. Line 25. 25, thank you. And read to, um, read to yourself to 99, line 16. Yes, sir. You told, you told Mark Jensen, I know there was some type of contact there. There had to be in this chest area, Mark. There is no question about that. And the only person that could have done that was you. I'm thinking before you left, you pushed on her maybe. Now she was frail at the time. She was frail. You said she was labored breathing. That makes sense, and I believe that. Okay, I know that probably happened, but she's frail. And you just innocently, I don't want to push her like that. 
And could that have caused something? I mean, we have petechia of the lungs. There's some type of contact here in the throat. There's also been an indication on the throat, as I showed you in Dr. Chambliss's report. It did not just appear there. Something and somebody had to touch her. That's the only way it could get there. There's no doubt about that. And did you push her, touch her on the throat maybe, maybe like this? Did you say that to Mark Jensen? I did, yes. I'm gonna ask you to go to page 152, lines three to six. Lines three to six, sir? Yes. Okay. Yes. You told Mr. Jensen, maybe when you pulled her over this way, you pushed her back on the chest and then went back and brought her up again. You know, you would have pushed her back. Yes, I asked that question. I'm going to ask you to go to page 161, lines 19 through 20. <clears throat> yes, sir. You told him... We still have to explain the nose part. The head pushed into the pillow. How are we going to explain that? I mean, that's there, right? Yes. Finally, I'm going to ask you to go to 162, lines 4 to 9. Yes, sir. Said so something had to push it down. We've got, there's three things that happened here. Head being pushed, the nose, some type of contact here at the throat, and some type of contact here in the chest. Okay, we know that happened, okay? You were the only one there, you had to do something, Mark. Did you say that to Mark Jensen? I did. It's pretty obvious the transcript of that interrogation was played since we've just been reading it, right? Correct, yes. I want to talk a little bit about um, Julie Jensen's log, the harassment log. Yes. I'm going to give you State's Exhibit 34 to look at as I ask you. Sorry. It's right there. Is that uh, the log that we've been talking about? Yes. Okay. 34. Okay, and starting at uh, page 33, okay. that's where it starts, right? I actually have it starting at page 31 in this log, sir. Okay, well, if you could go to page 33. I'm there. All right, and that's what you see on the screen? Yes. Okay, and um, it uh, details hang-ups and incidents at the house, right? That is correct, yes. And if you could find um, page uh, 38. I'm there, sir. Okay, is that what's on the screen? The top half of it is, yes. All right. 
Well, the top half is the part I'm most interested in at the moment. Um, and it says, June 3rd, 1996, uh, Detective Ratsburg called with results of subpoena for trace of phone calls received April 19th, 96. April 19th, 1996, Friday, 10.01 p.m., calling Mark an asshole. To your understanding, that was referring to a phone call that had been uh, reported to you? Yes. And it says, came from low-income apartment on the west side of town. Woman didn't know any of us, but said other people used her phone. Detective asked if we knew any of the following, Tina Thomas, Steve Daniels, Jenny Gunderson or Frank Espinoza. Neither Mark or I know any of these names. Is that, do you see that? Yes, that's in Julie Jensen's log. In her log, have you reviewed this prior to testifying here yesterday? Yes. Log? Um, nowhere is there a report in this log that Mark Jensen was receiving photos in the mail at work between 1996 and 1998. I don't know. I would have to go through it, but uh, you're not trying to trick me or anything, are you? Okay, then that's, that, that would be fair. And consistent with that, as your investigation turned up, no one at Stiffel recalled receiving any photos in the mail. Correct. Now, page 40 in the log, at the bottom, I think. Scroll to the bottom. The kind of bottom line says, I think that's December 26, 1996, right? Yes. It says, phone calls to Mark's office and asked secretary if received postcard. And that's um, the only sort of thing related to any of this harassment that was submitted to the crime lab. Yes. And the crime lab uh, determined that it was not Mark Jensen's handwriting, correct? Correct, yes. Tucked in the beginning of, um, I guess, in the inside cover of that log are some letters from Ameritech, aren't there? There are, yes. <coughs> and and there's a letter dated September 27th, 1995. Do you see that? Yes. And I've got uh, this marked as Defense Exhibit 51. Yes, it's already marked. I, I recognize it. Has it been marked as an exhibit? Is it, it was part of, it's part of that exhibit. Okay. It's part of that exhibit. I marked it as a separate exhibit. Okay. Thank you. And there's a packet of information here, and I want you to please confirm you have those materials in front of you. Thank you. I'm really only going to ask you the first two questions. Very good, sir. I've I've reviewed them. That's consistent with what's inside of her, inside the cover of the log? Yes. And that letter from Ameritech, it has, uh, it's notifying Mark and Julie Jensen that placed tracing equipment on your telephone line. Correct, yes. Okay. 
And then in the bottom right corner is handwritten 1114.95. Do you see that? It says we'll start 1115 for another three weeks. I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, I got several pages here. Yes, I see it now. Yes. Okay. November 14th, there's a note. We'll start 1115 for another three weeks. Report calls, right? Yes. And then there's some notes at the bottom of that letter that says calls from out of state, question mark, pay phones, question mark, cellular car, question mark, local only, question mark. Yes. And I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to pull up the, the log again. Yeah, and if you could page 36 of the log. Yes. There are calls reported on November 14th, November 15th, November 20th, two on the 22nd. November 24th, November 26th, right? Yes. And it's your understanding that these could not be tracked because they were out of area, correct? Correct. Out of area to you meant out of state? Correct. Not something within the same area code? Yes. Yes, not something without in the same area code. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a little bit about Julie Jensen's day planner. Yes. Can you op you have it opened up? I do. Okay. Um, that's the cover of it, right? That's the first page, at least. Not the cover, but the first page that's on the screen. Yes. What does it say on the uh, top right corner, kind of vertical? It has Scott McCraig slash Kelly Labonte. Okay. And this is Julie Jensen's day planner? It is. On, uh, if you could go to March 18th. Of 1998, sir? Yes. I mean, I think this whole thing is 1998, right? Yes. I'm there at March 18th. Okay. You see an entry for TurboTax? I do, yes. Is that consistent with your investigation that you learned that Julie Jensen did finances on the Jensen home computer? Yes. To the, you were asked yesterday on direct exam about... Uh, Entries in December of 1998. Yes. On December 7th. Yes. You see an entry for Little Bears? I do, yes. And you know that that's uh, the daycare for their youngest son? Yes. And that's a regularly scheduled thing that appears in the calendar, right? It is. On December 7th, uh, it lists book club. Yes. You can see on this page that's on the screen right now, you see that heart that you talked about? Yes. That's for uh, heart guard medicine or heartworm medicine for dogs, right? Yes. Okay. Um, 
Do you know, uh, did you ever learn uh, what time uh, the dog would be taken out in the morning at the Jensen household? No. On You see the Stiffel Christmas party noted on that page? Yes, December 11th, 1998, Stiffel Christmas party. You have no idea if she planned on attending that? I have no idea. The following week of December 14th, you see Little Bears, Piano, Kids Castle, French Club, those are the entries basically, right? Correct, yes. These are all entries for events scheduled for her kids. Yes. The week of December 21st. Yes. Uh, again, the daycare, last day of school, right? Yes. You don't see any notation of any Christmas parties or holiday parties? No. You have no idea when these regularly scheduled events were put in her calendar? No. If you could go, I guess, back in time to September 28th. Yes. <laughs> There's a note about apply to hospital, right? Yes, there is. Do you know if she applied at a hospital? No, I don't. On October 16th, it says volunteer. Do you know if she volunteered or where that was at? I don't know. <clears throat> you didn't follow up in December of 1998 in terms of the events on her calendar that preceded her death in terms of if she attended or her activities following up with those, did you? No, I didn't. That's fine. Yes. Of course, I handed those to you, and I don't have marked. Which one's 48? The University of Wisconsin Parkside. It's a, a two-page document uh, marked as D48. And the other one's 49? Yes, sir. And that's, uh, a certified, that's a copy of a certified copy of a transcript for Gateway Technical College? Yes. That is uh, listed as Defense Exhibit D49 from Gateway Technical College. Starting with D49 um, from Gateway Technical College, that's a transcript for Julie Jensen, correct? It is. And it indicates that in 1996, she took a course called Human Body Structure and Function. Yes. And received an A in it, correct? Yes. And the transcript from UW Parkside on D48, You have that in front of you? I do, yes. Okay. Um, it includes courses, bioscience and intro into human development. Yes. In the spring of 1978, she took nutrition and general chemistry. Yes. Took principles of human physiology. Yes. She took a class called Death and Dying. Yes.
All of them? Yeah. I still have this here if you want to want this right away. As of 1998, how many years of experience had you had? Oh, I, that would be an estimate. Uh, 12 to 15 would be an estimate. Okay. And that was writing reports? Yes. As, as, a, as an officer, then a detective? Yes. I started at the police department on the auxiliary. I was, uh, yes. Uh, I had different, continually got promoted, and I was a detective sergeant at the time in 1998. Okay. Um, trained to be as accurate as possible in your reports? Yes. Uh, you've done, worked on thousands of cases? Yes. Uh, you need to keep detailed reports because you need to have a record to remember what happened? Correct, yes. And other people need to be able to look at those reports? Yes. And rely on them? Yes. And you've been trained to do reports as soon after an incident as possible? Try to, yes. Um, if you don't promptly note it, it can be difficult to remember it. Absolutely. I mean, today we're talking about something that happened in 1998, right? We are. And include all the information you think is important. That's fair? Yes, fair. Do you remember interviewing Laura Shore in this case? And if you don't, or if you need to see um, your report in this matter, just uh, let me know. Yes, I am going to need to see that, sir. handed you um, what's stamped at the bottom, 973. Is that from your uh, police summary, your narrative report, I mean? Yes, it is. Okay. You can just read it to yourself and let me know if that uh, refreshes your recollection. Yes. When you interviewed Laura Shore, all those things about documenting the important stuff uh, was at play when you typed this up, right? Yes. Okay. You wouldn't have put something in here that wasn't told to you, correct? Yes. Laura Shore told you that she spoke with Julie Jensen and she related that Julie had a job lined up at Bradford and was to start at December was to start on December seventh, nineteen ninety eight. Correct. Correct. That's something that Laura Shore told you. Yes. 
that Julie Jensen told her that she had a job at Bradford High School and start date was December 7th, 1998. Correct. <laughs> you testified yesterday about talking with Dave Nearing. I did. And that although you don't have any report that he told you in 2002 or 2004 about some sketchbook of penis drawings. Yes. And you didn't, um, you didn't document any of that. Correct. And this conversation that you <coughs> remember happened by your estimation 18 to 20 years ago. Yes. No further questions. Uh, redirect? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Let's start with the photos. And um, mm -hmm. it was Mark Jensen that told you about photos being mailed to him at the office, wasn't it? Yes. In fact, I'll direct your attention to page 43 of the transcript of your interview. And as I've indicated, Your Honor, the state's going to be um, producing a copy to have be marked as an exhibit. Is the television turned on? Because it's not coming up there. Who? Is it on? Yeah. There we go. Can you read it? Um, do you recall the following question to Mark Jensen? Question, and I just want you to cooperate with me so we can get down to the bottom. Now, you left the photos around there, right? Am I right on that? Can you give me that? Did you leave some of them there? Answer, there were times when I didn't, I'd get stuff in the mail. I wouldn't give it to her initially because it would cause a great deal of upset and that wasn't helping us. Is that the question you posed to him and the answer he gave? Yes. And then he went on to say, answer, there were times I just threw them away when I got them, but I mean in terms of having the photos, question, did you leave them around the house? Answer, no. No, I did not. I mean, absolutely not. I mean, but there were times when I would just throw them away, when I would stick them someplace like in the garage for a while and then bring them out so she knew what was going on. Question, so that I'm clear here. I don't understand. Answer, in terms of question, you would get a photograph in the mail with her in it showing her with a man's penis. Answer, yeah, and that was the stuff. It was very early on. I got that in the mail. I mean at the office. Question, okay, answer in the mail. So as Mark Jensen was telling you early on that he's receiving these communications in the mail at the office, correct? Yes. And then do you recall posing the following question in council? This is page 50, line 19. Question, and you ended up showing the majority of them to her? Answer, exactly. Question, although they, go ahead please, answer. How many times do you have to see pictures like that and get reminded of it before you just, you kind of go, man, it's not worth it. It gets old, you put it away. And I'd put them away and then something would happen and I'd get pissed off and I'd pull them out and I'd say, I found these in the shed. Question, when in fact you had them, answer, I had them. I mean, you know, I mean, they'd accumulate them for weeks.
Question, now why would somebody send them to you in the mail? I don't understand that. I mean, we cleared Perry of doing it. Answer, I have no idea. So those questions and answers were posed to you? Yes. Now, with respect to the conversation about Mark Jensen going to see Dr. Borman, let me go to Directing the court and counsel's attention to page, I think it's page 13, line one. Did you want those on the screen, sir? I am going to. Okay. Question, this is what, in fact, I marked some of the things in here because we, you seem to indicate to me that you thought that she could have died from some type of overdose or an allergic reaction to the Paxil and Abrium, which you meant to say Ambien. I think it was that she was prescribed. Answer, okay, question, right? And then you supplied me with answer, well, that's what was here. Question, this here, which makes you know her unsteadiness and all of that. Answer, because you mentioned... Uh, I'm sorry, question, because you mentioned, and yeah, I don't want to get the dates mixed up, but this was on the second that you were concerned you went to see over to Dr. Borman's, right? Correct. Question, okay, and what happened? Okay, she was not feeling well. You called Dr. Borman to begin, begin with. She did answer, right. Question, okay, what happened after that? Answer, she saw him Tuesday. Question, which would have been what when you say Tuesday? The first Question, the first, okay. Answer, the night of the first, early morning of the second, it was when we got this off the internet. Second or yeah, it would have been Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, I went and saw Borman. I didn't call him, I just went over to the office. Do you recall that, posing those questions and getting those answers? Yes. Now, And then question, answer, he gave me the prescription for the sleeping pills Wednesday morning, right. Question, right, that was answer the ambient. Question, ambient, right. Now, when he was describing this, the purpose of, the purpose of showing her the printout about the Paxil was to explain why she was feeling intoxicated in the early morning hours of December 2nd, correct? Yes. Speculation. Uh, overall, go ahead. Well, he explained to you why they, he pulled up the paroxetine, the, the paper about paroxetine and Paxil, didn't he? Yes, he did. And it was because she was acting like she was drunk in the middle of, of the night uh, on December 2nd, correct? Yes, that is correct. Now, and th those signs that you've learned in the course of this investigation that behaving as though you're in, feeling as though you're intoxicated that's a sign of ethylene glycol, the first stage of ethylene glycol poisoning, correct? It is the first stage, yes. And so if somebody had knowingly ingested ethylene glycol um, on the evening of the first, that person would understand why they're feeling intoxicated. Objection, speculation. What's... Uh, well, I, I allowed the speculation, first... Speculation, Your Honor. If, if the person has researched... I'll, I'll allow it. I allowed the first one. This is the lead detective. Go ahead. So, if somebody has ingested knowingly and intentionally ingested ethylene glycol in the evening of the f December first, 
and then they're feeling intoxicated in the early morning hours of December 2nd, they wouldn't have any questions about why they were feeling that way. They'd know that that's the first stage of ethylene glycol poisoning, correct? That is correct, yes. But Mark Jensen indicated to you that Julie was feeling intoxicated and she was rubbing her knees and was wondering why that was, and that's why he pulled up the description of paroxetine or Paxil. Isn't that true? Yes, it is true. Now, so Julie didn't know why she was feeling intoxicated. Yes. So, isn't it convenient to have her ingest something that he can pull up? He can pull up stuff on the internet that makes it sound like, well, this is a p possible side effect of Paxil. Objection, argumentative. It was convenient for Mark Jensen to do that, wasn't it? Why don't you just rephrase it, Mr. Jamar? Well, where is the exhibit on paroxetine? Is that? Um, I think they're. Uh, Let's try to keep the exhibits on the table up here. Oh, I see. Your attention to Defense Exhibit 50, and Your Honor, I believe Defense Exhibit 50 into evidence. Uh, 50 will be received. So there were there were certain portions of that exhibit that um, had been. There was an asterisk place placed next to it, and then another one where was asterisk placed next to it, and it was underlined. Correct? Yes, that is correct. Can you find the part that was asterisked and underlined? That would be page 22 of 25, and there's a star there, and the item next to it is nervous system. Thank you. <coughs> that one's not underlined, so show me the part that's underlined. Show me the part that's underlined. Page 25. Oh, right there. Yes. That's page 25, correct? Yes. And I'll go back to my microphone so that the jury can hear me. No, I need the document. Okay, so um, the asterisk was on, on page 22. Um, asterisk, and then it reads nervous system frequent amnesia, CNS stimulation, concentration impaired, depression, emotional liability, vertigo. And then after that, infrequent, abnormal thinking, akinesia, alcohol abuse, ataxia, convulsion, depersonalization, hallucination, hyperkinesia, a whole bunch of stuff. And then rare, um, it refers to a number of rare circumstances. But then we go to page 25, which is not only asterisk, then there are certain portions of it um, which has an asterisk next to it. And underlined were the words, any drug which affects the central nervous system can cause drowsiness or lethargy. Avoid drinking alcohol. Those were the parts that were underlined, correct? Yes.
So listed under, on page 22, one of the first, well, one of the things that's listed as a frequent problem is vertigo, correct? Yes. Concentration impaired. Yes. Some of the symptoms that Julie was manifesting in the early morning hours of December 2nd, 1998. Correct? Yes. So it was convenient, wasn't it, for Mr. Jensen to be able to pull this off the internet and show it to Julie Jensen, correct? Yes. Now, he made reference to showing her on the computer, but in fact, it wasn't on the computer. He printed it off the computer, correct? That is correct, yes. Now, if she was able to get up, he could have just shown it to her on the computer, correct? Yes. But actually what he did is he printed it out. Yes. And that suggests to you that he printed it off the computer and then he took it into the bedroom to show it to her. Had to have, yes. Now, if Julie Jensen had intentionally ingested alcohol, or I'm sorry, ethylene glycol, in the, early, in the evening hours of December 1st, 1998, she would fully expect to be feeling intoxicated in the early morning hours of December 2nd, 1998, correct? That's very likely, yes. But the reason, the reasonable inference to draw from this is that she didn't expect to feel intoxicated in the early morning hours of December 2nd, 1998. Yes. And further, you're aware of the fact that later, on the, in, at around 10 o'clock on the morning of December 2nd, when she was talking to Margaret Voigt, she was again feeling these symptoms, I object correct? The, I object to the just endless leading right now. Why don't you rephrase it, Mr. Jones? Do you recall that later, uh, around 10 o'clock in the morning, Julie Jensen spoke to somebody over the telephone? Yes. Who did she speak to? Uh, the Voigts, the neighbors to the south. Well, she spoke to Margaret Voigt in particular, correct? She did, yes. And Margaret Voigt had observed, had she not made certain observations about the way Julie sounded? Yes. And what did she indicate about the way Julie sounded? She sounded drunk or may possibly disorientated. And furthermore, Julie had said at that point, whoa, this medication, she didn't expect to have that impact on her, correct? Yes. So even at 10 o'clock in the morning, Julie Jensen was still confused about why she was feeling this way. Yes. Which would suggest that she did not know she'd consumed, she had ingested ethylene glycol. Absolutely. But there was somebody that knew that she'd ingested ethylene glycol. I'm sure there was. And pulling off the side effects on paroxetine would be a convenient way to mislead Julie, wouldn't it? It would be. Nothing further. Uh, re, uh, recross. Yeah, just a few questions. Sure. Characterize this correctly. You just testified on redirect that if a person had taken ethylene glycol, they would have known why they were feeling intoxicated, right? Yes. And that there would have been no reason for wondering why she felt intoxicated. Correct. All of that assumes she was being honest with Mark Jensen about her intoxication and having taken ethylene glycol. Yes. You said even at 10 a.m. with her call to uh, Mrs. Voigt that Julie was confused about why she felt this way, right? Correct. Again, that assumes that she would have called and been honest about having taken ethylene glycol. Can you repeat that one more time, the last part? That assumes honesty, right? It assumes that Julie Jensen was being forthright with her neighbor about having taken ethylene glycol. Objection, that question is argumentative, Your Honor. I'll allow it, go ahead, answer it. Assuming that she was being honest, yes. Is that possible? Yes. Now, have you studied ethylene glycol poisoning? A little bit. Yeah, are you familiar with all of the symptoms of phase one? No. Were you able to look at that list of symptoms of paroxetine, of Paxil, 
And um, is it your testimony that those are the exact same symptoms as ethylene glycol poisoning? They're not. Uh, the one that I'm familiar with with the first stage is the drunkenness because uh, ethylene glycol actually has alcohol in it. <laughs> that's so that's the, how I know that. Why don't you let him finish his I, answer? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I thought he had. No. Um, that's the only similarity that you saw, correct? Yes. Now, uh, you just came to a conclusion that because it was printed off, that meant he had to have taken it to her in the bedroom, right? I'm trying to recall if he told me that or not, and I just don't remember without reviewing it. Can you take notes on something without printing it off? Yes. Say that, say that one more time. Can, Can you, you take notes on a document without having printed it off? No. I mean, you can now, but um, yes. in 1998, you couldn't, right? Yes. Not that I'm aware of. Let me put it that way. That's all. Thank all right, you. We're done with this witness. Thank you. Do, do we have all the exhibits? Yeah, and I need to move a number into evidence. Yeah. I don't want any on the attorney's desks as we will not be able to find them. Let's start moving in what you want to move in. And please uh, use the microphone so we all can hear. Do we have any exhibits there? Put them on the, put them over here. to evidence exhibits 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, and 52. All right, those are received. Does the state have anything they wish to move in at this time? I'd moved. I'd moved it in earlier, Your Honor. I don't think you already any, moved them in. Yeah, I, okay. I don't think there's any more at this juncture. There, we will be moving in the transcript of the interview at a later Just time. Remind us when we come back. Okay. Yes. Okay, folks. It's, the fifty's already been received. All right, so it's been received for the record fifty once before. Thank you. Okay. Have a good lunch, 115. Thank you. Okay, we're holding the jury. I got it. We'll get one away. I gotta make sure they're dead.
Um, let me take a look at that. Please stand for the jury. All right, we are back on the record of Mark Jensen, 2002 CF314. The appearances are the same. Uh, thank you for coming back on time, folks. I'm really impressed on your uh, showing up. Um, this morning we started at 8.33. This afternoon we're starting at 1.16. Thank you for taking your obligation serious. Okay, who's our next witness? The state calls Jason Ruff, number 64. 64, thank you. All the way up front, sir, and I'll swear you in when you come up here, if you could remain standing and raise your right hand. So we swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. If you can get as close as you can to that microphone. Spell your first and last name for the reporter. Yes, my name is Jason Ruff. That is J-A-S-O-N-R-U-F-F, -F, as in Frank. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. McNeil. How are you employed? I work for the Wisconsin Department of Justice uh, Division of Criminal Investigation as a digital forensic examiner. Okay, can you just tell us briefly what a digital forensic examiner does? Yeah, so a digital forensic examiner conducts forensic examinations of digital evidence. So anything from cell phones, computers, um, really anything that houses uh, ones and zeros within within it is uh, what I'm what I'm examining. And you said that's the Wisconsin Department of Justice. Yes. Um, I'm going to hand you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 54. <coughs> Thank you. Is that your uh, resume or CV? This is, yes. All right, so I'm going to put that on the screen as well. Okay, so can you tell us first, let's go to your education, what education you have that qualifies you uh, to be in your current position? Yes, yeah, so I got my undergraduate degree from University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, back in 2012 and then from there I got a master's degree in criminology and uh, from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice um, back in 2015 I have to reference this 2014 my apologies and then Utica University I got a uh, graduate degree a master's degree in cybersecurity with a focus in computer forensics and then 
from there, I've done numerous trainings, uh, just to name a few. I was uh, did training with the FBI's cell phone analysis surveillance team. Um, I've done SQL, which is like a computing language with UWM uh, through the police department, uh, Milwaukee Police Department. Uh, I, through my actual education, my master's degree, I got a certificate in cyber defense education. Um, I have training in X-Ways, which is a forensic tool that it, we use frequently uh, nowadays. Um, I've gone twice to the National Computer Forensic Institute, which is run by the United States Secret Service for advanced forensics and forensic scripting. Um, in addition to that, I've gotten several different trainings from the National White Collar Crime Institute. Uh, some, to name a few, were uh, intermediate digital forensics, uh, specifically for SQLite, which is, again, that SQL, that um, computing language, um, advanced forensics in uh, cell phone and Mac forensics. Um, and I also have a certification with the Economic Crime Council for uh, forensic hacking investigations. So um, not only do you have this master's degree in computer forensics, you also have these additional trainings? Correct. And then every day your work has to do with computer forensics? Yes. All right, so um, just going through some of your prior work experience, it looks like um, you worked for the New York City Department of Probation in the MAP unit. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, so the MAP unit, this was, this was an, uh, an internship actually, but it it's, was specifically, it's basically their analysis unit. Um, because New York City is such a large city and they house probably some of the largest amount of people under their probation, um, the, the specific project that I was generally tasked with, tasked with was their step-down program, which was essentially analyzing what um, individuals on probation were doing and basically seeing if they were ready for alternative treatments outside of general probation standards. And that had to do with statistics? Yeah, more statistics. So you're doing a, a computer side of that sort of study? Yes, yeah. All right, so now I want to talk about uh, your work with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. Um, what did you do there relating to um, uh, computer studies or computer work? Yes, yeah, so I was a project analyst, uh, research analyst with the Department of Corrections. Uh, specifically, what I worked on is there is a federal law called PREA, which is the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, and at the time, the Department of Corrections was trying to implement and create a unified investigative um, uh, database so that they could track their investigations as they were going along, while on top of that, tracking and ensuring that they um, were meeting the standards of the PREA. I was one of the, the project leaders um, in helping implement that. So from, from 2015 to two, or 2000, yeah, 15 to 2016, I pretty much uh, assisted in creating that program. And so that was creating the database? Yes. And the tracking system? And the tracking system, yes. Okay, and then before uh, your current job, you worked for the Milwaukee Police Department? Yes. And what did you do there? So for the Milwaukee Police Department, I worked in, technically I worked in two locations. My main location was in the Fusion Division, which was focused mostly in sensitive crimes and human trafficking. So I'd work with their sensitive crimes division. Uh, what I do uh, specifically in that is analysis on major incidents as they relate to sensitive crimes, um, specifically a lot of cell phone analysis as people, as we use cell phones in our daily lives frequently, um, that frequently came up, um, and kind of matching it between multiple different uh, investigations. 
And then finally, um, with the Wisconsin Department of Justice, um, what do you do every day? So every day, Wisconsin Department of Justice, it is acquiring and analyzing digital evidence. So kind of growing off of what I did in the Milwaukee Police Department, which was analyzing the actual data itself uh, in the Department of Justice, I also acquire that data, uh, ensure its integrity for court purposes and investigative purposes. Um, and I uh, make sure that the results that I get are are accurate and uh, yeah. Okay, so if there's a piece of digital evidence that would have relevance to some kind of criminal investigation comes to the Wisconsin Department of Justice, then you're one of the analysts who takes a look at that. Correct. That is and so what kind of devices are we talking about? So it, there's a wide range of devices, um, specifically lots of computers and cell phones. Uh, on top of that, surveillance systems. Um, it could be body cam footage. It could be pretty much routers, um, servers, any anything that really houses uh, information that we would use or we would call like information technology. So those ones and zeros that uh, travel through through our fiber optic lines. Okay, and you've been doing that since March of 2020? Correct. All right, so now I want you to tell us um, in your job, if you're assigned a case that uh, has a computer that you need to analyze, what do you do to conduct that analysis? So to conduct that analysis, you never want to if you can help it, you never want to actually do the full analysis on the physical device because what you're actually examining with a, in digital forensics isn't necessarily the physical device, it's the information that's stored on that physical device. So what has to be done, so let's say a computer, is you remove the storage device, which is usually a hard drive. Uh, with that hard drive, you then uh, plug it into what's known as a write blocker that can either be software or hardware. Now, the reason why you want to use a write blocker is you prevent overwriting of data, um, accidental clicks on things that you don't want to Want, don't want to mess up that evidence. And then from that write blocker, you plug it into your forensic workstation and you do what's called imaging. So that is the actual acquisition of those ones and zeros. Uh, um, and so once you gather that image, the, which is a bit for bit copy of the actual hard drive itself, you can re return the hard drive itself back to the computer, use that uh, image, and you usually want to make copies of those images. Just it's always good to have redundancy in forensics. And that is what you're actually examining off of. Okay, and so what is this image called? Is it a forensic image? Yeah, forensic image. Okay, so a forensic image of the device. And is that true of any electronic device? Like um, we talked about a computer, but is that what you would do with a cell phone? So cell phones are slightly different um, because cell phones rely a lot more on cloud storage and they rely a lot more on like active network connections. Uh, to an extent, you can do that uh, with a cell phone. Cell phones, because the data itself is generally proprietarily held by different applications that you may have, uh, different um, operating systems that are on the cell phones, the, the way that you acquire that data, um, you generally don't use a write blocker with a cell phone. That's pretty much the biggest difference between a cell phone um, and, a, uh, and a computer. And um, is this even true for um, external devices? Like if you had like something as simple as a thumb drive to analyze, would you make a forensic image of that? Yes, you'd make a forensic image of that. You'd use a write blocker, go through the same procedures as you would with a, a computer. Now, is this procedure that you've just described that you do in your, in your daily work, is this like the standard across forensic analysts? Yeah, I would say this is pretty much the standard and it's been the standard. So it's not unique to you or unique to Wisconsin? Absolutely not. And so um, as long as there have been write blockers and the ability to make these copies, that's what has been done? Correct. 
Now, for this particular case that we're here to talk about, um, you were not the first analyst on the case, correct? That is correct. Because that would have been 1998. Yep. Um, And what were you doing in 1998? I was probably in middle school or elementary school. I have to to go back and... (laughs) Okay, so we didn't give this to an elementary school child. Okay. Yeah, yes. Um, However, um, you were assigned to review this case... And so did you access the forensic image of uh, what was designated item A, the Jensen home computer? I did. And uh, who is the person who made that forensic image? Uh, Brad Haller, uh, examiner Brad Haller. And um, did you do anything to make sure that the forensic image you were looking at was an exact copy of that hard drive that would have been in the home computer? Yes, I did. So... One more step, and this is a step that is true of no matter what electronic device you're 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 dealing with, is there are these different things called hash values, Um, and what hash values are is to a person who's not necessarily well versed in computers, it's going to look like a long string of numbers and letters. Now, the way that these hash values are created are by the different complex algorithms. At the time, they used what's called the Media Digest 5 algorithm, which even today is still the standard algorithm that you use. Now, what it does is it takes aspects of that actual physical device, so that hard drive that we're actually copying, and it calculates out this this hash value that you get. And then what happens after you're done imaging the actual computer itself, you take that forensic image and then you hash the forensic image and compare the two hash values together. If they're a match, you know you have a bit-for-bit copy. If they're not a match, you don't. So for this case, I took the original images and their original hash values that they had as they were compared to the physical copies that were done uh, back back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and then I rehashed the images themselves and found that the image was an exact bit-for-bit copy. Okay, so that's just to verify that you are, in fact, looking at an exact copy of this hard drive from the Jensen Home Computer. Correct. Now, before we get into some more details, um, this is a computer that you were looking at from 1998, Correct. Correct. Um, And so I imagine technology has changed since that time? Uh, It's changed vastly, yes. So how is a 1998 computer different from a computer that you might receive today? So in in comparison, a computer from 1998 is far smaller in terms of storage, how much you can you can store in the actual computer. I want to say nowadays the average computer has between 256 gigabytes and 500 gigabytes of storage. This computer was around 10 gigabytes of storage, 10 to 12 gigabytes of storage. So that right there is a sign. In addition to that, uh, computers nowadays, um, because everything everybody wants to be have every device they have connected uh, generally automatically connect to the internet um, and to cloud servers which wasn't even a, a thing back then I don't know if it was even a concept back then um, so they're pretty rudimentary um, at most they're they're pretty much just storing files and they 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 weren't as adopted as they were nowadays so not as many people had computers back then. If you had access to computers, it was usually through your workplace or school. Um, a lot of the times, even through schools, it might be one or two computers in the actual school that the kids have to work on. But in terms, of, it's night and day. They're all, they're, it, it's kind of it's kind of kind of like a, a if you're comparing like a prehistoric human to a modern human there there's aspects of them that are the same and you can see where things grew out of them but the differences are 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 vast um and so when you examine this computer how did this computer access the internet uh through a dial-up internet so you would actually have to and for those of you who remember you would have to actually uh plug into a phone line to get access to the internet and you get that fun dial-up noise and have to wait and hope that nobody answered the phone or pug- pulled you off off of that. 
Okay, so for this computer that we're going to be talking about, um, we've learned that this computer was booted on on December 17th of 1998. And so um, when you're examining this case and you have that knowledge, what are you looking for when you're doing your examination? So with that knowledge, well, first of all, that's a huge no, 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 in, in terms of digital forensics. Uh, you you want to leave a computer in the state it's on. So what I'm looking for with the knowledge that that device is on is I'm seeing where there may be timestamps that may have, have changed. So like the most recent timestamps would have been from December 17th. Um, I'm, I'm looking to see where those timestamps are in the actual system itself so that I know what was actually being done in the computer on December 17th. Um, in addition to that, uh, I'm, I'm kind of seeing just really anything that was done on that date uh, just to see what I can rely on and what I can't rely on. So um, are you saying that when you see something occurred on this computer on December 17th of 1998, then you know it can't be attributed to any suspect? Correct. It can, it can only be attributed to whoever was manipulating it on that day. And because you have that knowledge that it was booted, you wouldn't have um, any reason to confuse the actions of the person who's the suspect versus the person who booted it on December 17th. Correct. And so um, when you're talking about there being, as a result of turning on this computer on December 17th, when you talk about there being date changes, um, are you talking about dates changing to December 17th or anything else? Yes. So uh, in, a, in computers, uh, to make it as simple as possible, there's basically three different areas on a computer. Uh, there is your user area, which makes up the vast majority of the actual computer, so that's the thing that everybody interacts with. There's the system area, which is usually kind of like the hidden files, the files you're not dealing with, or the files that you might go deep into your computer and look at and say, I have no idea what this is. Uh, and then there's the unallocated space, which is that empty space, uh, deleted files, all that, that fun stuff. The updates that happen... Uh, happen on that system file because computers themselves, and this is true to today, I mean a little bit more complex nowadays, computers are essentially giant filing systems. So they're keeping track of things such as when a computer is actually turned on, when a computer is turned off, what programs are being accessed. So those would be the dates that are actually changed on that December 17th date. And then you would see, instead of whatever date there was before, you would see December 17th, 1998. That is correct. And so um, whatever value having the prior date would have been, it just doesn't exist anymore. That is correct. And when a computer is uh, rebooted, is it possible that some things are overwritten? So yeah, unfortunately, because of how certain devices work and we own even nowadays, we only have limited amount of storage on computers. The way that they're programmed is that generally the older items within their certain file paths generally are overwritten as things are manipulated and changed um, in that sense. So, for example, in this situation, uh, the last logon dates and things like that would have been overwritten and amended to that 27, or 2017, geez. Uh, uh, December 17th uh, time frame. In addition to that, uh, things and automatic processes that might have been set up when you turn the computer on, they might have been initiated, which could have caused some potential issues there. Um, so then, in cases that you um, analyze other cases, uh, you sometimes get devices that the police have not been able to seize until days or weeks after the crime. Is that correct? That's very frequently. 
Okay, and so once the police are able to seize a device, um, they wait and send it to you and have it copied and write blocked like you've told us, right? Correct. Um, but obviously from the time of the crime till the time the device is seized, um, there's no control over what's happening with that device. Absolutely, yes. It could be turned off, turned on. The suspect might try to delete things. Um, is that yeah, accurate? Yeah, that's, that's an accurate statement. And so sometimes do you try to look and examine if you can find deleted things on a computer? Uh, that's, yeah, we look to see deleted things, things that have been partially overwritten all the time in digital forensics. That's, that's one of the main, one of the main, main things we do when we first, first get into and acquire. And that's something that was done in this case as well. That's correct. And then also I, I want to make clear um, whether some things did not change as a result of the computer being booted on December 17th, 1998, okay? So uh, during your testimony, we're going to talk about a lot of dates and times. Um, when you are testifying to a date or a time today, um, if when you're shown that date and time, uh, there's no reason for you to believe that that would have changed as a result of the computer being turned on December 17th, 1998. That is correct. So, for instance, if we're talking about uh, searches that happen on the computer on December 2nd or December 3rd of 1998, and we see a date and we see a time, there's no reason to believe that the, the December 17th event changed that date or time. That is correct, yeah. And in fact, if the date or time was changed as a result of turning on the computer on December 17th, 1998, then the date you would have seen is December 17th, 1998. That is correct. All right, so um, I'm going to start by showing you, um, this is on State's Exhibit 55, and this is a, a PowerPoint presentation. Now, when, we, when you're testifying about this Jensen home computer, I first want you to tell us um, whether there was anything in the internet history for this Jensen home computer that would have been visible to uh, someone who was a user of the computer um, after or as of December 3rd, 1998? Uh, no. And so um, first off, let's break this down and tell us what is internet history? So internet history, um, yeah, I'm gonna try to break it down for what, what most of us see as internet history is what we're looking looking at when we literally go to our internet history tab and see what we've been looking at. Uh, in addition to that, you have other things such as, so let me step back just a, a little bit. So when we're talking about going on the internet or surfing the internet, it's somewhat of a misstatement. What we're actually doing is downloading the internet. We're downloading those sites that we're having. So there are traces that are left on our computer. Uh, those traces, uh, specifically among many, many different files are known as HTML files. So that is basically the code that makes up each of those websites. Those can be saved. And generally, those are saved in your temporary internet history. So when you, the reason for a temporary internet history is so that uh, the computer, it takes a little bit less of the stress off of the computer for loading the actual websites themselves. So that is one type of internet history. Another type of internet history could be cookies, which uh, I'm sure we've all heard of cookies. If not, uh, essentially it's just a term, an industry term that's used for different, different types of artifacts that are used to, to essentially initiate and help the actual websites themselves. Um, take some of the stress off of them. They can house anything from past passwords that you might have saved on those websites, uh, sizes of your actual browser so that it renders correctly and you're not getting weird, weirdly sized lettering, uh, anything from that. And then you have your actual, what we see as internet history, which is the physical websites that you went to. 
All right, so I'm guessing that most people, when we're thinking about internet history, we're thinking about we go on our web browser and there's some button you click at the top that says history, and then all these websites you've been to recently show up. Um, so are you familiar with that? Yes, yes. Okay. And was that the same on a web browser, or on the web browser on this 1998 computer? It was uh, slightly different. Um, but fairly, fairly similar to what it was in a modern, modern browser in terms of that kind of internet history. Okay, so um, on this 1998 Jensen home computer, if someone turned on the browser for the internet and then looked at the internet history, does anything appear? No, nothing appeared. And. If we know that this computer did access the internet, was accessing the internet for months, why would nothing appear in the internet history? Uh, likely it would have had to have been deleted um, and older internet history would have gotten overwritten after, uh, after time. Um, but in terms of this computer that was initially seized on December 3rd um, of 1998 and then uh, first turned on December 17th of 1998 and then analyzed after that, if it had been on the Internet, we should have seen something there, right? Correct. Correct. Um, and so the fact that you don't see anything there means the user deleted it? Yes, it's indicative of uh, user deletion. Now, is there another place on the computer um, so if we move past the browser and what we're all familiar with, clicking on the internet history, is there another place on the computer where a user could access internet history? Yes. So in specifically in the 1998 computer, uh, you can go through, well, and I should say in modern computers now, but specifically for the 1998 computer, you would have to go through the actual file system itself. Uh, you'd have to go into the Windows path and navigate your way to that actual uh, internet history, get to that, and then delete it. And that would delete it from the computer uh, without, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> in order to show us um, on the Jensen home computer what the internet history or lack thereof looks like, what did you do? So one of the great things about uh, the forensic images that we collect is they're also very similar, well, they're the exact same thing as when, let's say, that something happens to your computer, you have to go take it to uh, a store and physically recreate it. Uh, they do something very similar to that. So what I was able to do, because it is a bit-for-bit -bit copy, uh, an exact copy, I'm able to do what's called a virtual machine. Uh, what a virtual machine and uh, is essentially it's a computer, a guest computer running on a host computer. So what I did is I recreated the, the desktop and the computer as it was not connected to the internet using that virtual machine or using that uh, forensic image um, so that I could follow the file paths and I'm not just looking at it from like a forensic back back standpoint point of view where I'm not looking at like ones and zeros and things like that. I'm looking at it as if the user is actually looking at it. Okay, so as the user would see it. All right, so then I'm showing you the second slide here and I'm going to play this and then you can tell us um, what this is. Your Honor, before we do this, I do believe that at this point it would make sense that we actually get this into evidence and I think that uh, not doing so is problematic for the record. Has this uh, exhibit been marked? It has. This is Exhibit 55, and I would move it into evidence. Are we good? I would simply ask for more information about how this was created and who created it. Well, I thought you said to move it into evidence, and I just did. Okay. So I'm... I mean, you could ask him the questions. Okay, so um, you're familiar with uh, this PowerPoint presentation, correct? correct? And it shows the data from the Jensen home computer. Correct. And this is, uh, this is something that you personally analyzed? Yes. Um, and so the exhibit is uh, it's a visual aid, correct? Yes, correct. For the data that you saw on the computer? Correct. Okay, um, so let's go back for a second because this is a video that uh, we're playing, so I have to... 
start it over. Okay, so what we're looking at on the screen here um, can, is can, that- I, Hang on, can we just close that window for a second? Hopefully that's not my car. Or mine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so what we're looking at here on the screen is this actually um, the Jensen home computer? Correct, this is the- the virtual machine that was created with the uh, forensic image. Okay, so this is not some other Windows 98 computer or an example of what a Windows 1998 computer would look like? Correct. This is what the Jensen home computer had on it? Yes. In terms of Internet Explorer? Correct. Okay, and then what you showed us in this video, um, what? It, well, actually, just tell us, what did this video show us? So what this video specifically showed is... Uh, if you're on the computer, if you went into the actual web browser, how to delete the uh, internet history. Okay, and so then what were you doing here? So I was going to the internet, let me look this way, it's easier. Uh, I was going into the Internet Explorer browser. I went over to the history tab and where it shows today, that would be where the internet history is and then you would click delete. Okay. and. Um, in fact, when you did go into this Internet Explorer, you did not see, um, in this particular area of the computer, any prior Internet history. No. Which, um, which indicated that it had been deleted. So because this is the virtual machine and it's not connected to the Internet, this specific image wouldn't necessarily show that, that aspect of it. It would show it in the file path. So... I can't say that about this, this specific video, but based off of other examinations when I went into my actual, uh, when I looked into the actual um, index files and things like that, the actual system information, that's where I saw that there are discrepancies between what's there and what's in deleted or not space. Okay, and so, um in terms of this particular video that you showed us, this would be one way of deleting the internet history on this computer, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and now, moving to the third slide, um, can you narrate for us as this slide plays um, what's occurring here? Yes. So uh, we are back in the actual website. Um, or website, the actual virtual machine. I have to go into Windows Explorer and scroll down in the C drive. And then I am going over to the Windows uh, tab, which is uh, within that file system. And scrolling down to that history tab and then seeing the today internet history. And then that would be how you delete that. Okay, so if a user of the computer were to try to delete the internet history in Windows Explorer, these steps that you've just shown us is what the user would do? Correct. Okay, so now tell us, based on your examination of this computer, was there evidence that the user was deleting the internet history? Yes, there was, there was evidence that internet history was being deleted, um, yes. And tell us about that. So... I will I'll put a caveat there because when, when, cause the internet history is overwritten after a certain amount of time, and because the computer was turned on on uh, the 17th, uh, what I can tell based off of underlying system files, uh, history uh, that goes 20 days back had been deleted uh, on that, that computer, and it was deleted on the 29th of November, the 2nd of December, and the 3rd of December. 
Okay. And so um, based upon your analysis, you could at least see those three separate times that the user had deleted internet history. Correct. Now, in your analysis of this computer, were you in fact able to recover internet history? Yes, I was able to recover uh, much of the internet history. Okay, and so um, is this something that you would need your um, specialized uh, software to do? So uh, in terms of an analysis, uh, just turning on the computer and searching for the internet history wouldn't be good enough? No, yeah, you would need uh, specific forensic tools to actually get that that and recover that internet history. Okay, so um, if someone had booted on this computer and tried to find the internet history based upon the deletions that you saw, they wouldn't be able to find it. Correct. Um, so what were you able to do using your forensic tools? So what I was able to do, so if you remember, I told you there are uh, three different areas. So there are this, what we're going to talk about is the system areas and the unallocated space. So when an individual deletes information, specifically in this case, the internet history, as I said, the computer itself is a machine that's basically a filing system to assist humans. So when you're deleting your internet history, what you're essentially doing is removing it from your site, removing it from anybody who might go on to it, but the computer itself still has that information logged on it. Uh, the reason for that, um, well, there's many reasons for that. It assists in the computer's just basic functions and all of, all of that kind of information so that it can gather those websites faster the next time that you want to go on to them. The other is the unallocated space. So computers have a bunch of free space on it that is unused, uh, and then that's where the information gets written to it. When you delete something, rather than it actually just wiping away and turning those, those ones and zeros into nothingness, what it does is it de-indexes it from the actual computer itself so that when you're looking at it through the operating system, to you it appears that it's no longer there. What actually that is, is it's a space called unallocated space, which is basically freed up so that the computer understands that as more and more things get written onto it, it can write over that, that information. And so um, is this the general idea that just because you, the user, think you're deleting something from your computer, it doesn't mean it's gone? Correct. So you think you've deleted it, you can't find it on your computer anymore, but it's, uh, an analyst using forensic tools might be able to find it. That is correct. Um, and is that what you did to uh, find the internet history on this computer? That is correct, yes. And did you, in fact, compile a document um, of internet history or an Excel spreadsheet of internet history? I did. All right, so this is also on States Exhibit 55, so I'm going to bring this up. And so if you look... States Exhibit 55 on the screen here, the Excel document entitled Internet History Central Time. Um, is this what you compiled of the internet history on this computer? That is correct. All right, so if we zoom in a bit. Oh, I don't know what I just did there. Okay, so we see at the top here we see stuff from December 17th of 1998. Would that be the computer being booted on on that day? Yes. Okay, so you know when you're analyzing this computer that that's not attributable to any suspect. Correct. Okay, and then the internet history after that starts on 12-3 of 1998 at 9.42 a.m., is that correct? That is correct. Um, and so what we're looking at here is this all of the internet history that you were able to compile from this hard drive? This is as complete as I was able to compile from the computer, correct? All right, so um, before we go further, 
based upon your review of the hard drive of this computer, can you tell um, at least an approximate date when this computer began to be used? Uh, based off of the information that was on the computer around July 6th of uh, 1998. Okay, so that's when it appeared to you that this computer started to be used. Correct. Now, you talked about going on the internet and how that actually involves some degree of downloading things from the internet. Can you um, explain what is actually downloaded when someone's going on the internet? So, um, and you can't really see it in this, but, well, yeah, you can. So when you are going to a website, um, especially back in, in the day of dial-up, if, if any of you who had dial-up remember thing, the way things would render, the, the pictures would sort of kind of do like a scrolling scrolling motion, that's them actually downloading to your device and it's slowly being rendered on your actual computer. So if you see something, for example, this is just an example, but those, the GIF, the, the GIF files or GIF files, uh, those would be pictures on a specific website um, that was on there. So that is kind of the information that's being downloaded. Um, specifically, it's doing that so that, again, the system, when it goes back to it, it can re-render those files a lot quicker the next time you go on. So for this computer, based on this concept that you've just described for us, is it possible for us to actually see, at least partially, some of these 1998 websites that were visited? Yes, that is correct. And so... Um, now, this internet history, this complete internet history that you uh, compiled, are we able to see all of the websites on this internet history? No, you are only able to see what is either recoverable in that unallocated space or what is already in the temporary internet history. And um, so if there is an HTML file associated with the uh, internet history, are we able to then see it? Yes. Okay, but if the particular internet history um, on this list that you've compiled does not have that associated file, then you can't see the website. That is correct. <laughs> okay, so um, on the presentation that we're talking about, um, when we see a website on that presentation, it's because you were able to recover from the computer the HTML file for that website. Yes. But not every website was that possible for. No. Okay, so before we get to that, though, let's go to... All right, so let's zoom in a bit on this. Were you able to map out day by day when the internet was being used on this Jensen home computer? I was. And is that what, we're going to see various slides that look like this, monthly slides. Is that what these slides represent? Correct. So what we're looking at here, July of 1998. Yes. You were able to find in the internet history, for example, internet activity on this Friday, 2.43 p.m. to 2.44 p.m.? Correct. And then Saturday, 1.23 p.m.? Correct. Then if we move over Sunday, 4.57 a.m., 5.26 to 5.26 a.m.? That's correct. And then 5.14 p.m. to 7.11 p.m.? That is correct. Okay. Now, during your review of the Internet history of this computer, um, was there internet activity in the normal working hours, let's say about 8 a.m. to 5 p.m.? Very sparsely. Um, so almost never? Yes. And so when was, the internet, uh, when was the internet most commonly accessed on this computer? So the primary usage that I saw was primarily in the early morning hours and late night hours or evening hours. Okay, so let's just look at the month of July. We have um, Sunday and then 
Monday, 1.21 a.m., and then 10.06 p.m. to 10.08 p.m.? Is that correct. accurate? Yes, correct. Sorry. Okay, and then, again, on Tuesday, we have very early morning Internet activity. Correct. And then late at night Internet activity, 11.51 p.m., 11.53 p.m. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay, so then going to Thursday again, 11-something at night, Internet activity? Correct. Friday, early morning hours, Internet activity, 12.14 to 2.02? Correct. And then Saturday, 1.17 a.m.? Correct. And then once again, the next week, so we are on Tuesday, 12.51 a.m. Internet? That is correct. Then the next Wednesday, 9.35 p.m.? That is correct. And then going to the end of the month, early morning hours that Sunday? Correct. And then early morning hours the next Monday? That is correct. Then on the 30th, so that would be Thursday, early morning, and then late at night? Correct. Okay, so during the whole month of July, the only time during the week that the internet was accessed during like normal work hours was this July 10th, 2.43 yes. p.m. Now, if we look at the Excel spreadsheet, can we see what was accessed at this time? Yes. yes yeah. All right, let's take a look at that. So we have to go all the way down to July 10th. Oops. All right, so we see July 10th, 2.43 p.m., and then I'm just going to scroll up until we get past that. Oh. Yeah, so these are it, based off of the actual um, file extensions themselves. Those are uh, more system files related to the actual Internet. Um, I wouldn't be able to say fully based on the age of the actual files themselves, obviously who and, and how specifically that they were being rendered, but those are files that come natural at the time with Internet Explorer. So, for example, if you're first starting up a computer or around that time you're first starting up a computer, um, certain files have to continually update themselves. Uh, and at the time, because computers weren't naturally connected to the internet, um, whether you left it on and let, let the computer <laughs> upload or you turned it on specifically at that time to get those, those files to upload, uh, that would, that, that's kind of what those files are specifically. They're not necessarily websites themselves. They're the actual remnants of things that were programmed into Internet Explorer and Windows at the time. So, for example, um, in a little while, we're going to see actual, like, browsing sessions on the computer where you can see the user going from website to website, correct? Correct. And that is not what you see on July 10th of 1998? No. All right, so that was the only time during regular work hours in July, correct? Correct. All right, so then moving to August, let's zoom in on August. All right, so once again, Monday, August 3rd, we see early morning hours Internet activity. Correct. Same with the Wednesday, the 5th, early morning. Correct. Also the 6th, early morning. Correct. And then Saturday, the 8th, late at night? Correct. Now moving to the Sunday, the 9th, early morning hours? Correct. Nothing the rest of the week? And then finally, we have two Sundays here. So we have Sunday, the 23rd, 1.09 p.m., and then Sunday, the 30th, 3.37 a.m., and... 10:28 p.m. Correct. 
All right, so during normal work day hours in August, you did not see any internet activity. That is correct. Okay, now let's go to September. All right, so on the Friday, late in the evening, 10, 21 p.m., is that correct? That is correct. And then Saturday, 3, 12 p.m. and 9, 03 p.m.? That is correct. Sunday, early morning activity, and then in the afternoon, 2, 12 p.m., 4, 10 p.m. to 4, 49 p.m., is that correct? That is correct. Okay, Monday, early morning activity and late in the evening activity? That is correct. Tuesday, early morning activity? That is correct. Then the 9th, early morning activity? That is correct. And once again, we're on September. The 11th, early morning activity? Yes. The Sunday, there's afternoon activity, 4.32 p.m.? Yep, correct. And then the 14th, early morning activity, very early morning, 1231, and then early in the morning, 627 a.m.? That is correct. So then that Thursday, we once again have early morning activity, the 17th, correct? That is correct. Then Monday the 21st, late at night? That is correct. 24th, late at night? That is correct. 25th, early morning. That is correct. And 28th, early morning, and then late at night. That is correct. Okay, so during the month of September, during the week, during normal business hours, no internet activity. Not that I was able to recover, no. All right, so now there's a, a few uh, of these websites I want to now show you for September, so what you were able to recover where we can see the actual website, okay? Okay. So I'll just ask you a few questions about those. All right, so first off, this screen here, what does this tell us? So that is an uh, HTML file. So as I said before, an HTML file is, HTML is essentially a scripting language for websites. And when it's a .html file and you're using a web browser, um, it's able to read that code and then populate what the website looks like. So what this is, is a HTML file uh, entitled intranet uh, stifle. Um, so that, that it's a HTML file from that website. Okay, and um, when we see these screens, we're gonna see these, these type of screens repeated over and over again, right? Yes. So it tells us the date um, that this website that follows is accessed, is that correct? Yes. And then it tells us the time. Correct. correct. And then it tells us the HTML file. Correct. Okay, so then what we're going to be doing uh, right now is uh, browsing some 1998 internet. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so this is very small. But is this this Stiefel intranet? That is correct. The HTML from that? That is correct, yes. And so... How would one access an intranet for a company back in 1998? So back in 1998, uh, again, it's different than this. You would obviously go to your web browser, type in your actual whatever the URL is, which is the, the website, the, the long string, the www dot whatever's in the middle dot com, and then you'd access it that way. And then for Stifle or Stiefel, um, you would have to do some sort of login information uh, through my analysis of this they used I believe Exchange so that would have been Windows um, which would have been like an Outlook or a Windows based um, email server that they amended so that it had their names on it and everything like that and that's how you would get into it. Okay so again this is the Jensen home computer. Correct. Right. And so you saw that on Sunday, September 6th at 1.40 a.m., the user of the computer is accessing the Stiefel intranet. Correct. 
And in order to do that, you said that you saw they had to enter some kind of Microsoft Exchange password or... Yeah, something? they had to go to the website and then essentially log in. All right. And then same date, just a little after this, do we see the user accessing emails? Correct. And... Um, on this home computer, these emails that were accessed appeared to be from someone by the name of Kelly Labonte. That is correct. <laughs> and so in your analysis of this computer, did you see a variety of emails between Kelly Labonte and Mark Jensen? I did. Now, from what you could tell, this is accessed through his work email, right? That is correct, yes. And so... Um, is that the same how people do it today, accessing their work email? Uh, primarily, if people are accessing their work email, um, I, I guess it depends on where you're working, but uh, either you would have to have access to your internal system, or I, I suppose if they're less secure, you could go to a website and just log in. But usually, yeah, m most of the time people don't have a personal and a and a work email. So the user of this computer was accessing Stiefel work email? Correct. Through dial-up internet? Through dial-up, yep. All right, and then shortly thereafter, this is where you see the actual emails, right? That is correct. And so again, a bunch of these were recovered from this computer, correct? Correct. All right, so now let's go to the times for October of 1998, the times of Internet usage. Now, if we look at the very beginning of the month of October 1998, we are not seeing Internet activity during that time period, correct? Correct. None that you were able to recover? None that I was able to recover, no. So these three days beginning of, of October, no Internet history? That is correct. Okay, so then going to Sunday the 4th, you were able to recover internet activity in the late evening hours? Yes. Then the 5th, early morning hours? Yes. The 7th, late evening hours? Yes. The 8th, early morning hours? Yes. The 9th, early morning hours? Yes. The 10th, there's some in the afternoon. That is correct. So that's a Saturday, right? Yes. Saturday the 10th. And then evening hours? Uh, yes. Now moving to Sunday the 11th, you see afternoon activity? Correct. And then evening activity? Correct. Okay, so moving to Monday, early morning hours, correct? Correct. And then late evening hours? That is correct. Then moving to the 13th, early morning hours? That is correct. And then late evening with the bottom entry, 11.46 p.m.? That is correct. Moving to the 14th, so this is a Wednesday, the 14th, early correct. morning hours? Correct. And then 9.17 p.m.? That is correct. And then moving to 10 p.m. to 11.57 p.m.? Correct. Okay, then Thursday, early morning hours? That is correct. And then later that evening? Yes. Okay. Friday the 16th, early morning hours? Correct. Later that evening? Correct. The 17th, early morning hours? That is correct. Okay. Then the 18th, early morning hours? Correct. And then 6.51 p.m. to 6.54 p.m.? That is correct. And then 9.30 p.m. to 10, I think that's 10.18 p.m.? Correct. Okay, then Monday, the 19th, early morning hours again? Correct. So then we see again a gap of days, October 20th through the 24th with no internet activity, correct? Correct. And then it starts up again, October 25th in the evening? Yes. October 26th in the evening? Yes. Later evening? The 28th, early morning? Correct. 
29th early morning. Correct. And now we do have something on the 30th at 1156 a.m., correct? That is correct. Other than the 30th, during the regular days of the week, during normal work hours, 8 to 5-ish, there's no internet activity, correct? That's correct. And then there's this gap like we talked about at the beginning of the month and then here in the third week of the month. Yes. Okay. So now if we want to see what was happening on the 30th, at 11.56 a.m., can we go to our Excel spreadsheet? Yes. Okay. I think when I zoomed in, I lost the date. All right, so October 30th, 1998, 11.56 a.m. And for some reason, I don't know, maybe it's not large enough, the date disappears, whoops. Okay, so what is happening at that time? So that uh, specific thing is a cookie that we talked about. Cookies frequently update themselves um, based on connection to the internet. Okay, so this internet activity that was noted is not a browsing session. No. Okay. And that's the only daytime internet activity during the month of October during the week. Correct. All right, so let's go back to the 1998 internet. So now, once again, we see one of these screens with the, the date and the time and the HTML, correct? Correct. Okay. And so on this October 5th, early morning hours, we see some emails being accessed, correct? That is correct. And once again, these are the emails with Kelly Labonte, correct? That is correct. Okay. And shortly after these emails are accessed, um, what is this page? Uh, this is a page, it, look, it appears to me to be a like financial page or a website of some sort. Um. Okay. And did you see pages um, that appear to be from this website pretty frequently? Yes. Okay. And then it says on the bottom here, the street.com. That is correct, yes. So like Wall Street? Yeah, Wall Street. Um. Okay. Shortly thereafter, more email? Correct. Email. Okay, now moving to October 9th, early morning hours. Email again. Correct. Mark Jensen, Kelly Labonte. Correct. Email again, Mark Jensen, Kelly Labonte. Correct. All right, so then moving to Sunday, October 11th at 2.37 p.m. So this being a Sunday, this is midday browsing, correct? That is correct. Okay. And this website that we see appears to have something to do with phishing? <coughs> yes. Okay. Now, how come when we're looking at the 1998 Internet, how come we can't see whatever these things are? Uh, so the little boxes with the Xs, that are those are the other other things in that that browsing history that you see that don't have that HTML. Frequently, those are tied to advertisers. So the website uh, administrator themselves isn't the person who's actually controlling what goes inside of those. It's it's whatever advertiser is currently um, currently in those those spots. So those those were not recoverable um, since they frequently change. Okay, and so when we're looking through the websites and we see this kind of box with the red X, that's an HTML that couldn't be recovered. Either an HTML or an image or something, some, some sort of uh, file. So it could be a picture of something? Could be a picture, yes. All right, so looking at the same Sunday, more phishing? Correct. Right. Okay. 
then we move a little bit later on the Sunday to a search for Patagonia, correct? Correct. Now, what is this search engine? What is uh, this? It's the Yahoo search engine. Okay. Did you see any Google on this computer? I did not see Google on this computer. Pre-Google? Yes. I, I believe okay. Google came around in 2004, so. So Yahoo searches. Yahoo searches. All right. So the first search we see on this computer um, that you're seeing on, these, on this um, slideshow is for this Patagonia. Correct. Okay. And then did you see that the Patagonia website is accessed? Yes. Okay. And again, we can see the words by these red X's, but there's some kind of image or something that's missing? Yes. Okay. And so there appears to be some online shopping here, right? That is correct. A fleece furnace? Yes. Okay, so now moving on to later in the day on Sunday, October 11th, 1036 p.m. Once again, we're seeing the emails between Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte, right? That is correct. Does this look like an email that's in the middle of being drafted? Like a yes. reply? Yes, or it was sitting on the page. Yeah. Okay, so now moving on to Monday, October 12th, 1998. Okay. Now we see on this date that Mark Jensen under mjensen at execpc.com appears to be sending an email to various people with Stiefel addresses, correct? That is correct. Including a Jensen M at stiefel.com. Correct. And this email, it appears to reference uh, an online article. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And then on the computer, you can actually see this online article that was emailed, right? Correct. So the article that's referenced in the email is recovered in the HTML. That is correct. And this is a, the Wall Street article? Yes, yes. So if we page through it and get to the bottom. The street.com. Yes. Okay. And this once again was from the early morning hours. Yes. Okay. Then we return in the same early morning hours to the emails between Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte, correct? That is correct. And on this page then we can see a list of emails from Kelly Labonte? That is correct. And again, this is all recovered from the Jensen home computer? Yes. Okay, just more emails between these two individuals. Is that correct? That is correct. <clears throat> All right, so now moving to Tuesday, October 13th. 1.14 a.m., we see another search being conducted. Correct, yes, Correct. that's a search. And this one is for O'Hare Marriott? Yes. Okay.
And around the same time period, early morning hours, October 13th. It's, yes. We see the O'Hare Marriott website accessed? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right, then, same time period, we see a search for Mortons of Chicago. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay, and that's right after, right after the Marriott's being searched for, right? That is correct. Okay, so 2.43 a.m., and then Morton's website? Yep, that is correct. You can't see much because we don't have the images, but no, you can see the words, the... correct? Yes. Now go into the menu. Yes. The directory of locations. For Morton's. Further, yeah, further information on Morton's. And then directions for Morton's. That is correct. Okay, uh, here's the menu. No prices on this menu. Correct. Okay, so right after that, right after those websites are accessed, we see emails again. Yes. Kelly Labonte, Mark Jensen, Subject, Chicago. Correct. All right, so now moving to Wednesday, October 14th, 11.36 p.m. Did you see this website being accessed for Sprint? I did. So that's phone service? Yes. It's the homepage for Sprint phone service at that time. Okay, and then immediately after that is the website accessed for Sprint St. Louis coverage? That is correct, yes. And then Sprint Milwaukee coverage? That is correct. Okay, so now we see another Yahoo search. Bass Pro? Yes, this would be a search for Bass Pro fishing shop. And the phishing website being accessed? That is correct. Thursday, October 15th, 12.52 a.m., Big Cedar. Correct. This is a website for the Big Cedar Lodge? Yes. One hour south of Bass Pro Shops, is that correct? Yes, yes. So we can see the Big Cedar related websites that are accessed? Yeah, that would, yes. This be the price site for it. For instance, the honeymoon cabin in the middle here? Correct. 
with prices. That is correct. Yes, that's the honeymoon cabin. HTML. All right. So, um, did you ever see when you were examining this uh, Jensen home computer? Did you ever see an email sent by Julie Jensen? Yes, I've saw quite a few emails. No, sent by Julie Jensen. Oh, sent by Julie Jensen. No, no, I did not. So the emails you saw are the ones that we saw on the screen. Mark Jensen, Kelly Labonte. Yes. Okay, so now we have another Yahoo search here on the bottom. And that one's a little hard to read, but does that say Windstar? Yes, it says Windstar. Okay. So this, the Windstar-related searches, October 15th, early morning hours. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, that is accurate. Okay, and was the Windstar website accessed? Yes, it was accessed. Okay, so for instance, on the Windstar website, then we see um, a variety of cruises being offered. Yes. And so just multiple pages of the cruise packages. That, that you were able to recover? That is correct, yes. And then finally, there's this page where someone could request a CD-ROM. Yes. So back, back in 1998, it was fairly common since web servers were a lot smaller and more robust than they are nowadays to, if you needed more information, they'd just mail you a CD-ROM. Or a CD. So you essentially request their advertisement? Yes, yeah, so you're essentially requesting advertisements. And so the that particular aspect of Windstar was accessed, correct? Correct. All right, so now there's quite a few searches um, that were occurring the early morning hours of Friday, October 16th, 1998. Um, so I want to examine the searches that were being conducted at that time. Okay. Your Honor, this may be a longer chapter, so I don't know if the jury wants a break now or if we want to. Well, I think it's uh, up to Ms. McNeil. Once it's her direct examination here. So, I mean, this is a, I would say, a significant chapter, so it is a okay time for a break. You want a break now or you want to wait? Break? All right, take a break, folks.
All rise for the jury. Seated. We're back on a record on Mark Jensen, 2002 CF 314. The appearances are the same. The witness is still under oath, and you can continue your direct testimony, Ms. McNeil. So you've been asked a lot of questions about this internet history and dates and times, correct? Correct. Now, when you examined the internet history on this computer, um, what's contained in that Excel spreadsheet, what time zone was that all in initially? Initially, it was in Pacific time. And why was it in Pacific time? So older computers, generally, when they were built, they were built out, out west. So the computer time zones were kind of set at that, that time. Uh, contrary to newer computers, um, a lot of the protocols and things that are created to automatically update your computers and phones and things didn't exist at that time. So the computer itself uh, just stayed in that time zone unless somebody manually changed it. Okay. And so when you examined this computer, it was still set in Pacific time. That is correct. Now, in terms of the system date and time, so like if the user is looking at the corner of the screen to see the system date and time, what was that set for? Are you talking about the, the computer itself? I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, apart from what the internet history is reading, um, the system date and time. So the system date and time, I'm, I th believe, was also in Pacific time. Okay, so in terms of this internet history, um, having drawn from it and seeing that it was in Pacific time, these times that we're seeing on the screen, is this in central time? Yes, I modified them with my forensic tools so that they'd match up with the current times. Okay, so all these dates and times we're seeing are in central time where this computer was located. Correct. And then one more thing about the dates and times. We've heard about this computer being booted up on December 17th of 1998. Um, does that cause you to question the accuracy of any of this internet history date and times um, that you're seeing in this presentation? It does not. Okay, so that particular issue with the computer being booted does not affect these dates and times? It, no. And so then just to be very clear, the date and time we are seeing, you are confident that that is the correct central standard date and time that this was occurring? I'm confident of that, yes. Okay, so now looking at what was occurring on Friday, October 16th, 1998 at 1.54 a.m., um, we start to see a series of searches, correct? That is correct. And so for these Yahoo searches, we actually see the search term at the bottom here. That is correct. Correct. So this first of the series of searches is for the word underground. That is correct. Now, if we go back to the top here, so. are we just seeing continuing results for that same search? Yeah, so this, this would be like if you go to the, the second page of the Yahoo search, it renders a new HTML because it's got new, uh, new search results on that so, site. So like in modern times, it's like reaching the next screen of your search results? Yeah, it's like going, going to the second page of Google but on Yahoo. The term is still the same though. That is correct, yes. Okay, then it appears the user accessed this website. That is correct. And then this website. That is correct. Okay, and then do we see a return to the search results? 
Yes, this is the next page of the search results, so return to it. Okay. Then the next page of the search results? That is correct. The next page of the search results? That is correct. More search results? More search results. All right, so now we're seeing a different category match? Yes, this would be a new search. And this is a search for drugs? Drugs, that is correct. So someone searched for drugs on the internet? That is correct. <laughs> and again, if we're paying attention to the times, this is all basically happening consecutively? Consecutively, correct? yes. Okay, then we have a search for the term botulism. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so then we see our search results for botulism. That is correct. And then can we see the sites that the user accessed Yes. Related you, to botulism? My apologies. Yes, you can see some of the sites that were accessed. Your Honor, at this point with these slides on, I'm going to ask for an instruction for the jury that these are what was displayed on, this, on the screen, but that we cannot verify the accuracy of the websites themselves. Well, this the is text. what is on the screen. He has been qualified as an expert, he can base an opinion what's on the screen. So, so Judge, I basically agree with the defense just in terms of, I think they're saying that just because a website gives certain information, it doesn't mean it's true, just like today on the internet. I think it was true in 1998, and it's true in 2023. So that well, depends will, on the website. that'll be for the record. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so that's the first of the botulism websites, and then we move on to... More search results, correct? More search results. Still for botulism, correct? Correct. And then here we have another website that is accessed for the botulism site, correct? Correct. Than another website for botulism. Okay, more search results? Correct. And then another botulism website, is that correct? That is correct. And then this website here, if you look at the words, they don't even really make sense, right? No, they do not. When I, you saw that? Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm not really sure. So they are, they are disconnected words just stringing together? That is correct. But the user accessed that site? User accessed, yes. Okay, so we have more search results, correct? Still for botulism? That is correct. Okay, so 
then we have some kind of recipe web page? That is correct. Okay. Apparently there was Netflix. Yep. Okay. Got DVDs at the time. <laughs> Isn't that when Netflix only gave you the discs, though, in the mail? Yep. You'd have that's to, net, yeah. For the record, that's when Netflix only had discs? For okay. the record, that's when Netflix only had the discs, and you had to set your subscription to either monthly, I don't, I don't remember exactly, something like that, yeah. All right, so then um, it, just if we look at the timing here, this is 2.13 a.m. for this website. Correct. And then shortly thereafter, it moves to another website. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And again, we're still on the topic of this botulism search. Yes, that is correct. And again, you're just showing us here cooking the websites that were accessed as a result of that search. Yes, yeah. It's a, another website related to botulism or cooking. Okay. More search results, correct? More search results further down. Another a, site for botulism. Another botulism website. All right, so now going to this particular search that's happening. Is that for poisoning? That is for poisoning. And so we're clear on the time frame this is at the end of the botulism searches, correct? Correct. October 16th, 1998. That is correct. 2.21 a.m. That is correct. Okay. Now, I've asked you a ver I have asked you a variety of questions about the searches that were done on this computer. Um, are there some uh, items that were not searched for? Um, I mean, lots so, of things weren't searched for. Right. Yeah. Drugs were searched for, right? Yes. Um, but to give you an example, was the word divorce searched for? No, it was not. In all of the internet history that you looked at for this computer, you never saw a search for divorce? When I was able to recover, no, absolutely no, no search for divorce. Okay. How about a search for something like child custody? No. How about a search for child support? No. Um, any searches for attorneys? Not that I recall, no. Like divorce attorney? No, no. Any court-related searches for divorce? Nope, no, no searches for divorce. All right, so moving to Friday, October 16th, 1998, 11.57 p.m. So now we are later in the evening of that Friday. Actually, almost to midnight of that Friday. Correct. What is this article here that was accessed by the user? So that is an article uh, about a man who was accused of um, blowing up his ex-wife with a pipe bomb, and it's his, his sentencing article. Okay. So again, regardless of whether anything is true or not, that is what this article is about. That, that is correct. That's what the article is about. Man who attempted to blow up his estranged ex-wife with a pipe bomb. Correct. All right, and so now we have moved, that other search was close to midnight, and now in the timing we've moved to just after midnight, on Oct so now we're on Saturday, October 17th, 1998. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And then we see a search some kind of chemical mercury fulminate yes okay in this website um you see it accesses jolly roger yes and what the user would have seen is about mercury fulminate is used as a primary explosive in the fabrication of detonators that is yes that's what's on the website so again whether it's true or not that's what the user would see Correct. 
Okay, and then there's a list of items here. You see that? The, yes, yes, I do. Includes syringe. Correct. <clears throat> then there appears to be a helpful caution on the bottom here. Acid will burn skin and destroy clothing. Is that, that is correct. I, there so again, is a the, caution. The user who saw this website would see these things. Would see that. Okay. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, uh, the HTML here is poolfund.html. You see that? Yep, that is correct. And it appears to be a website, or uh, yeah, a website by the Jolly Rogers again, um, specifically related to to pools um, and things you can do with them. Okay, and so does this actually involve uh, the sabotage of a pool? Yes, using chemicals. And so some kind of directions about that. Yes. Okay. Then shortly thereafter, we have another search, correct? That is correct for nicotine. And this search, if we actually get to the search word at the bottom here. It is for nicotine. Okay, and once again, we're continuing basically along the same browsing session, right? That is correct, yes. Okay, so continuing with the nicotine search, correct? That is correct. Okay, so now, just shortly thereafter that, 12.46 a.m., um, what do we see on this web page? So this is a, it says stifle branch listings. Uh, it appears to be the branch listings for the business stifle okay. on that website. And we see this individual was looked up on the branch listings. Correct. From Appleton, a Ron Ruck? Ruck, yeah. Oh, Internet Explorer cannot explain this web page. Okay, then do we see another person is looked up in these branch listings? Yes, uh, John Joseph. So John Joseph, branch manager, Colorado Springs, that's what the page displays? That is what it is, yes. Okay, and then uh, shortly thereafter that? Uh, it's a branch listing for John T. Joseph, a.k.a. Jock. So in John... Quotes. So is it a John T. quote, Jock, unquote, Joseph? Correct, yes. So that's what the screen displays? Again, for Colorado Springs. So that's what the user was accessing at this point? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> then shortly thereafter, something called Inbox. So does this appear to be an email inbox? Yes, a partial recovery of an email inbox. Okay. And then once again, do we see emails being accessed between the defendant and Kelly Labonte? That is correct.
And once again, that name appears, the Jock Joseph Colorado Springs? Correct. There appears to be some search screen that's accessed. Correct. That is correct. And on the next screen after the search screen, a variety of Kellys, including Kelly Labonte. That is correct. Okay, so before we lose the date and time. So now we have moved to Monday, October 19th, 1998 at 2.24 a.m. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Okay, and we're seeing more searches now? Correct. This one for pipe bomb? That is correct, yes. Okay. More results then for pipe bomb? That is correct. It's the next page. Then more results? That is correct. Following that, do we see a new search for the term anarchist? Anarchist, that is correct. And as a result of that search, did you see websites accessed for the anarchist cookbook? I did. And so this would be what the user accessed at this time? Yes, yes. Some website spunk press directory catalog? That is correct. Apparently they're collecting food and drink recipes. Yeah, this appears to be a different anarchist cookbook about literal food recipes for anarchists. <laughs> okay, and just so we don't miss the date and time, we're now at 3.14 a.m. on the same day, the 19th, correct? That is correct. So continuing with the anarchist search at that time as well. That is correct. correct. <laughs> okay, so now we get to November of 1998, and I'm going to ask you the same questions about the dates and times that the Internet is being accessed in November. Okay. Okay, so on the second, we see Internet activity in the late evening hours that Monday. That is correct. Then on the Tuesday, once again, the late evening hours, the third. That is correct. Then on the fourth, we have the very early morning hours. That is correct. And then late evening hours starting at 11.01. .01. Yes. Now, we see another gap in terms of internet um, activity, internet history. So November 5th, 6th, and 7th, um, you did not find any internet history on those days? Correct. Okay, so back to, got to go to the beginning. 
Also the eighth is missing. Then the ninth, do you see internet activity in the early morning? I do, yes. Then Tuesday the 10th, once again the early morning hours? Yes. Wednesday the 11th, early morning hours? Correct. And then another gap of days, 12th, 13th, 14th? That is correct. And then 15th without internet activity? That is correct. Okay, 16th, early morning hours? Correct. 17th evening, 9.47 p.m.? That is correct. Okay. Followed by a series of days, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st, where you did not see internet activity? That is correct. Then going to Sunday, the 22nd, looks like there's early morning internet activity. Is that correct? That is correct. And then afternoon internet activity, 4.43 to 5.09 p.m.? That is correct. And then the nighttime, 10.57 p.m., is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Then on the 23rd, the Monday, 11.50 p.m., is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And then we see a series of days, 24th and 25th, without activity, correct? Correct. All right. Then the 26th. So that would be the Thursday, early morning hours, correct? That is correct. And then late evening hours, correct? Correct. Moving to the 28th, early morning hours, correct? Correct. Then end of November, on Sunday we have very early morning, 421 a.m., correct? That is correct. And then Sunday, 5.13 to 5.14 p.m., is that accurate? That is accurate. Okay, so during these times that I've showed you during the month of November of 1998, um, Monday to Friday, regular business hours, 8 to 5, no Internet activity, correct? Correct. All right, so now we're going to look at some searches occurring on Tuesday, November 10th. Again, we have early morning hours, 2.35 a.m. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Okay. At this time, the search term is suicide? Yep, suicide. And then do we see, following that, something related to physician-assisted suicide? Yes, we do. Euthanasia? Is that accurate? That is accurate. And apparently this website on this topic references some website called Noel Early? That is correct. And did it appear that the user accessed that website? Yes. Okay, so this is apparently some individual? Yes. Okay, so then once again in these early morning hours of November 10th, 1998, 2.55 a.m. Do you see this website that the user would have accessed? I do. Okay, and appears to have a very long listing of... A variety of medical things? Medical, yeah. Following that, some kind of toxicology search? Correct. All right, so here we have references to various poison things, so like Florida Poison Information Center. Yes. Some kind of toxicology resource, internet resources for practitioners, educators, and researchers in medical, clinical, and occupational toxicology, and providers of poison information. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And then on the bottom here, toxic alcohols. 
effects of ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, methanol, and ethylene glycol. That is, is that correct. correct. Yep, that is correct. <coughs> okay. And then immediately following that, do we have another query for nicotine? Yes. Now, during this time, again, this is the same, um, same browsing session, as far as you can tell, correct? As far as I can tell, yes. So we see a variety of toxicology type websites accessed, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so I'll be showing you those. All right, then following those toxicology websites, do you see uh, this website here for the National Toxicology Program? I did. Okay, then following that, it appears some search is conducted, chemistry, health, and safety search. Yes, it looks like a website you can search in, yes, for, for that. And once again, it appears that nicotine is being searched. That is correct. You can see the quotation there for nicotine? Correct. And then following that, some kind of website. Yeah, it appears to be either some lab or scientific website related to uh, the rating corporation, and I'm not gonna nitro so I'm not gonna try yeah, that's to pronounce a pretty, that. That's so. a pretty long word starting with an M. I know it ends in nicotine. Yes. Nitrosone or nicotine. Okay. So just scrolling through, this is the website that the user would have accessed? That is true, yes. Now, going to December of 1998, once again with the internet activity, now we see on Tuesday, December 1st, internet activity occurring at 1.18 a.m., is that correct? Correct. And then on the 2nd, we see the morning internet activity, 4.31 a.m. to 4.35 a.m., is that correct? That is correct. And then later in the morning, 8.14 a.m. to 8.49 a.m., correct? That is correct. Then near lunchtime, 11.45 a.m. to 11.47 a.m. Correct. 
and then there's this gap until the PM search or internet activity, 9.31 p.m. to 9.43 p.m., is that correct? That is correct. So can't really fit it in one square, but this is not actually on the 9th, correct? Yes, it's a that's continu- on the 2nd. It's a continuation of the 2nd, correct? Correct. And then internet activity on the 3rd of December, early morning hours, 12.44 a.m., to 1.23 a.m., is that correct? That is correct. And then the morning, 9.40 a.m. to 9.42 a.m., is that correct? That is correct. Now, for this particular Internet activity in these three days in December of 1998, um, you were able to recover quite a few of these 1998 web pages, right? Yes, and part of the reason behind that is because it was, uh, all of it was still in the temporary internet history, uh, which is a folder, another another area that saves all of those HTMLs and other file paths. Um, now, to be clear, you had detected evidence of the user deleting history November 29th, December 2nd, and December 3rd, correct? <laughs> Correct. And the reason behind that is because the actual internet history as we know it, internet history wasn't there, but there was a large amount of files in this temporary internet history page which tied to these dates. So you found this internet history in the temporary files in spite of what appeared to be the effort to delete it? Correct. And then to be clear, when you examine this computer, um, the internet activity stopped after the third, correct? Yes, yes. Except for when the computer was booted on on the 17th. Correct. Okay, and so you saw that activity that I showed on the Excel spreadsheet, correct, on the 17th? That is correct, yes. Okay, so now going to Wednesday, December 2nd, 1998, 4.34 4.34 a.m. We see on this page what appears to be a search for Paxil or paroxetine, correct? That is correct. And then following immediately thereafter, so we get the date and time, December 2nd, 4.35 a.m. Correct. What appears to be the web page that is accessed for paroxetine, correct? That is correct. Okay, and I'm just going to click through this web page. So quite a long web page there addressing, or seems to be about paroxetine or Paxil, correct? That is correct. All right, so now moving to the morning of the 2nd at 8.16 a.m. There's a website accessed about ethylene glycol poisoning, is that correct? That is correct.
Okay, so immediately following that, there appears to be a website accessed regarding oxalic acid. That is correct. And again, regardless of whether it's true or not, this website says it is a metabolite of ethylene glycol. Correct. That's what it says. So that's what the user would have seen. Yes. Okay, then immediately after that, we see a website accessed and not sure how to pronounce that, but Fomespizzoli? Yeah, some... Okay, I'm, I'm, a chemical? Yeah, it's a chemical of some sort. I'm also not going to try to pronounce it. Okay, so we can see how it's spelled though, right? Correct. Okay. All right, and so again, regardless of whether this is true or not, what this website says is that chemical was approved for use after ethylene glycol poisoning. Correct. And then it provides a variety of other information. That is correct. So whatever this chemical it is, it appears to be related to treating ethylene glycol poisoning, correct? That is correct. And that's just the bottom of that website, right? That is correct, yes. Okay, immediately after that, there's a website accessed about toxic alcohols. Is that correct? That is correct. And it appears to present some kind of account or hypothetical of some individual ingesting a gulp of green liquid. Yes. Located in a Gatorade bottle. Correct? That is correct. A coworker stated that the engine antifreeze was transferred. So it appears to be some account of an individual ingesting ethylene glycol. That is correct. All right. And then below that, the same thing. Correct. Okay, immediately after that, a website that appears to address how to patients with toxic alcohol ingestion typically present. That is correct, yes. So again, we can see on the bottom here, regardless of whether this is true or not, it appears to be talking about manifestations of methanol and ethylene glycol. That is correct. And basically symptoms. Yes, symptoms. Okay, same bottom page, correct? That is correct. All right, and then immediately after that, see another website referencing ethylene glycol, correct? Yes. And then after that, some kind of article about dangers associated with ethanol substitutes. That is correct. All right, and that page just continues. Okay. Then immediately after that, 
another website on ethylene glycol? That is correct. And again, regardless of whether this is true or not, it appears to describe some symptoms. That is correct. And then that website appears to continue. Yes. Okay. And then shortly after that website is accessed, we have another website, correct? That is correct. Also about poisoning? That is correct. And in this list we're seeing in this website, one of the items is ethylene glycol, correct? That is, I'm sorry, that is true. Okay, and then immediately after that, appears to be the same website, just a different page, correct? Correct. And then immediately after that, by the look of it, same website, but specifically referring to the ethylene glycol. That is correct. And again, regardless of whether this is true or not, this is what the user would have seen. That is correct. Okay, and then that appears to be a continuation of this website? That does, yes. And again, regardless of whether it's true, a listing of symptoms? Yes. Then a listing of treatment? Correct. Antidotes? Correct. Okay, so now um, we're in a different time frame. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Okay, so we're just later, um, 11.45 a.m. on December 2nd, 1998, correct? That is correct. Um, and this website that we're, that we're going to see, it appears to be Anatomy Adam. That is, is that correct. correct. Yeah, that's what it is. Is that a website that you saw a lot? Yeah, it's one of the more frequented websites. Okay. <coughs> and is this here a continuation of the Anatomy Adam website? Correct. All in the same time frame? Yes. 
Okay, so on this website, this Anatomy Adam related website. This yeah, this was like its main splash page kind of. What did you describe it, this page it, as? So it's like its main page, like when you go to the website, pick all the options, kind of. So these what we're seeing here, the words in the middle, that would be something you could click on? Correct. Poisons? Correct. So based on your viewing of the this Anatomy Adam website, it appears to be somehow medically related? Yeah, medically related. And it does have a poisons category, correct? It does. Okay. And then, immediately follow that, We see a, a list of various, um, apparently, drugs, including overdose-related. That is correct, yes. Okay. And it's alphabetical? Yeah. Okay, so just clicking through the list. Did it appear that the user accessed, in this list, the letter E? Yes. And under the letter E... Is one of the listed items ethylene glycol? That is correct. And then again, this page is very limited, but from the words we can see, it appears the user accessed the ethylene glycol poison page. That is correct. And what we're seeing here is that basically a con continuation of that poison page for ethylene glycol? That is correct. And what we're seeing now is that just a continuation of the prior page? That is correct, yes. And again, regardless of whether it's true, this is what the user would have seen. Yes. Okay, so now we're moving to a different time frame. This would be Wednesday, December 2nd, 1998 at 9.34 p.m. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And at that time, again, we have a very limited website, but it appears to be referencing antifreeze poison. Yes. And does this appear to be similar in terms of the look of the website to the one that was accessed hours earlier? Correct. But this one, this one is labeled antifreeze. The prior one was labeled ethylene glycol? Yes. Okay, then looking at the next web page, it appears to be describing some medical condition, fast breathing. Yes. Respiratory rate rapid, rapid breathing. Correct.
And so this is what the user was accessing after accessing the antifreeze website? Correct. Okay, and then immediately after that, it appears the user um, using the same web page or the same look to it access something about rapid breathing? That is correct. And then, again, regardless of whether it's true, it describes things like skin discoloration, lips bluish. Correct. Bluish discoloration of the skin. Correct. Okay. Then that that page just continues. Correct. Immediately after that, the user appears to be looking for skin discoloration, bluish. That is correct. And then immediately after that, blood pressure low. Correct. And then this page that we're looking at now, does that appear to be the user accessing the low, low blood pressure page? Yes. All right, then immediately following that, there appears to be a page accessed about consumption of alcohol. That is correct. Okay, so now the time frame we're looking at is the very morning hours just a, after December 2nd has turned to December 3rd, 1998, correct? That is correct. So we are at 12.46 a.m.? Correct. At that time, is a site accessed about antifreeze poisoning? Yes. And shortly thereafter, some website uh, where you can only see the word tox toxicological emergencies. That is correct. Then shortly after that, are we once again seeing this series of websites that appears to be about symptoms of things? Yes. So this one is unconsciousness? Correct. Again, we are around 1 a.m. on December 3rd, 1998. That is correct.
And so the page we're seeing now, does that appear to be the user accessing this unconsciousness page? That is correct, yes. And then a continuation of that page? Yes. Okay, shortly after that, do we see the user accessing a page about consciousness decreased? Yes. And based on the following page, does it appear that the user actually clicked into that page? Correct. And then shortly after that, do we see more Yahoo searches? Yes. Looking at the search term, ethylene glycol poisoning? That is correct. Then shortly after that, another web page. That is correct. So we saw a listing of the H words in, uh, alphabetically on that prior page, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Then it appears that the user would have clicked on the hypertension. Correct. Is that correct? <clears throat> and then once again, we're seeing the similar pages that we, we just saw previously. Correct. Where it's a description of the symptom or the search term? That is correct. And then shortly after that, do we see another list of, this time we're in the T section? Yes. <coughs> and it appears the user accessed a site about bounding pulse. That is correct. And once again, a similar website is accessed? Correct. And one of the terms for that is tachycardia listed in this website? Yes. Okay, so once again, we see the list of the alphabetical terms, and this time the C section is accessed, correct? That is correct. And so immediately after that,
we see shock dash cardiogenic. That is correct. Same type of web web page we've been seeing. Yes, same type. And we can see there again, cardiogenic shock, correct? That is correct. Then immediately after that, a web page about weak or absent pulse is accessed. That is correct. And similar to the other pages in this um, section, just lists. Yes, it's very similar. Okay, so now we've moved to a different time frame. Yes. Thursday, December 3rd, 1998 at 9.40 a.m. That is correct. Okay. And so was there another Yahoo search that was conducted in this time frame? There was. Search term, ethylene glycol poisoning? That is correct. Now, in 1998, is the website um, like today, where if you've clicked on it, it's purple? Yes, it'll register as purple. All right, so looking just immediately thereafter, the same website as before in terms of the look of it. Now the term is diabetic ketoacidosis, is that, that correct? Is, yes, that is correct. And then the following page resembles the pages we had viewed before leading up to this, correct? Yes, it does. So this is making some reference to diabetic coma? Correct. And then immediately after that, we have the Yahoo page again. That is correct. Continuing results for the ethylene glycol poisoning. That is correct. All right, is that the end of the internet history then from December 3rd of 1998? That is, yes, that's what I believe. And there was no recoverable internet history after what I've just shown you on December 3rd, 1998? No, not on December 3rd, no. Um, so now we've, again, we've talked about this anatomy of Adam website. Correct. Um, so did you do something uh, to be able to show us um, what accessing this site would have looked like on the computer? Correct. So in that virtual machine I spoke about earlier, I went into the temporary internet history just to, because just to show how it would have rendered on the actual computer itself. So very similar to the screenshots, just more dynamic. Um, so what this video will show is just clicking through that website. Uh, 
in it, it's only going to the places where a user would have actually clicked because it's not actually connected to the internet. It is simply relying on that temporary internet history. All right, so this is going to play then like a video on the screen. <coughs> is that accurate? Correct. It's a video. Okay, and so we kind of saw with the um, with the slideshow previously this web page, and you can see again the things the user could click on, including that, the poisons aspect of that. That is correct, and the reason why those images are in in there and they weren't in the actual screenshots is because it's populating it as a, a full website in that temporary internet files section, as opposed to a simple HTML document. It's compiling all of that together. And you're able to show that by use of the virtual machine? Yes. Okay. And then this following uh, page we have here, are you again on the virtual machine? Correct. And then showing us the access to the ethylene, to ethylene glycol related web pages? Yes, it's the same, same thing. So once again, a video? Yes. All right, so um, I have a few additional questions about this home computer that you looked at and you analyzed and that we've been going through. Correct. Um, so again, on the virtual machine, are we actually able to see what this, I don't know what you, you would call it, a home screen look like on, on this computer? Yes, uh, it, yes. So on this 1998 computer from the Jensen home, the screen, if someone turned on the computer, looked like this, that what we see on the screen right now, would is that have, correct? Yeah, this would be a fair representation, yes. Okay, so it's, that's an accurate representation? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, so then I have a question about a couple of these icons. Um, we can see the Internet Explorer, right? Correct. And then there's some kind of exec PC icon. That um, is that's so if we're looking at the screen that would be on the left side the fourth icon down that is correct yes and then the fifth icon down is that the quicken yes okay and what is quicken uh from my research it was uh it's a like a tax filing you can do um investments and banking pretty much everything financial so some kind of financial computer program correct um, and if we go to the middle column, the very bottom image that's kind of red and white, what is that program? That is another tax um, tax website, or not website, application to work on. Um, is like it trading or trading, or? like a trader finance? I think it's the Trading Stock Pro or something. Okay, so it's a trading stock web. Yeah, like page. stocks and finance stuff, yeah. Okay, so that's what that program is? Correct. Okay. Um, and so now on this computer, did you explore um, what was actually in the Quicken program? I did. 
All right, and you made a video of that? Yeah, this is a visual representation, yes. Okay, so just like the other videos? Just like the other videos, yes. Okay. Okay, so regarding this Quicken program, were you specifically looking for files or something in this program related to the Jensen Home Finances? Yes, I was looking for uh, any files related to that, yes. And did you find anything that appeared to be the Jensen Home Finances? Outside of the one at the beginning where it shows that it says Jensen and then there's a file and then within it is a different account. Uh, there was nothing that I could find. So um, what we see you clicking through here, that appears to be, um, this financial information appears to be under the name Sorensen? That is correct. Okay, so we were seeing financial information, but that uh, is labeled Sorensen. That is correct. And did you find anything that looked like the balancing of a checkbook? Uh, no. And um, as you actually clicked through Quicken, as the user would be able to see it, um, did you see anything besides what you've shown us on the screen? I did not. So whatever material was saved in this Quicken computer program was very limited? Yes. And all of the things that actually had money amounts or stock amounts were under the name Sorensen, correct? That is correct. All right, so now before we move off the Jensen Home computer, I want to go back to the Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Now, on the uh, PowerPoint that we've just looked at, those were the internet websites where we could actually see something because there was the HTML file, correct? Correct. But in this Excel file, this is all the internet history you were able to recover, correct? That is correct. 
And so there's some internet history where we can't see anything more than basically what's in the Excel file in terms of a visual. That is correct. So it's still internet history. You still would have a date and time for when it's accessed on the computer. There's just no real visual to it. Yes. Um, now, when you looked at this computer, you, you, I believe you testified that you first saw activity that would indicate use on July 6th of 1998. Is that correct? That is correct. And did you examine the early internet uh, activity that was occurring in July on this computer? I did. And based on your examination of this early internet activity, did you see uh, access to pornographic sites? I did. All right, so I'm just going to direct your attention to specific pages in this internet history. Your Honor, I have an objection. I think we should possibly take it outside the presence of the jury. How much more direct do you have? Um, I don't have a ton more, um, but there's a few other devices that I have to uh, ask questions about. So I think I would be done by five um, if we continued until five. Well, we're going to have to have the jury leave. Let's go out for a minute and we'll figure out what we're going to do, okay? <clears throat> All right, the uh, jury is outside of the courtroom. What, what are you going to present now so I know how to handle the objection? Um, so this is related to pornographic searches that have to do with um, the topics that have been discussed so far regarding the pornography. So there's a search for uh, dick size. There's a search or there's a website that's accessed about oral sex. Um, there's a a website that's accessed um, erect guys, a website that's accessed blowjob central. Um, so the particular uh, pornographic sites being accessed, I think are exactly, fit in exactly with the other discussions of pornography in this case. You're not gonna go into any other categories, just what you mentioned. Right, and I'm just doing a few sites. Uh, you know, certainly there's a, a lot of history there, but I'm just highlighting the ones that fit into the pattern that we've been discussing. So it sounds like this information's already been presented to the jury and we're just showing what was in the computer. Correct, that's why I wanted to take this up outside the presence of the jury, because if we are going to be reading every single pornographic internet address, I think it would be But we're not going to do that. But we're not doing that. Yeah. We're going to be specific exactly what we've already talked about. Yes. Then I can withdraw the objection. All right. The objection is withdrawn. You think we should let the jury go home now? Um, I mean, it's really up to the court and counsel. I think we should. <laughs> All right. These are hard to watch. I agree with you, but I guess my only concern is that... Um, I, I think if she can get it done by five, I think it would be great and then start with cross. I mean, I, I would love to leave right now. I'm not saying that that's not a good idea. I'm just saying that. <laughs> I think Jeremy stop. wants I'm to leave. I'm just saying that like. I think, I think your co-counsel disagrees with you. <laughs> I, I'm just concerned about the length of the trial. If we, so I will leave it to the court. I'm not, I'm not going to rush this case. No, I know. And I, it's difficult to look up it screens all the time. I think you're humans can't handle that much. We're not robots. That's fine, Judge. I mean, the jury stares at it, and you could tell after a while they want a break. We all glaze over. You know, it's not like we have a live witness and we ask questions. We constantly stop, and then they got to look at the screen. Um, Fence has no objection to adjourning for the day. So we're going to bring them back and say we, uh, we have too much to finish today. They come back at 8.30. Okay, bring them back. Okay.
I'll rise for the jury. All right, we're back on the record on the um, Jensen matter, Mark D. Jensen, 2002 CF314. The appearances are the same. The objection has been withdrawn, folks, so the uh, state's going to be able to ask questions in this area. Uh, we're not going to be able to finish by 5, and uh, I don't like to drive when it's raining in the dark, so I want you to come back tomorrow. So <laughs> Have a good evening. Don't talk about a case. 8.30. Thank you. going forward sure thank you um i just want to make sure we do have a number of witnesses who are going to be essentially reputation for untruthfulness witnesses based on the blow up at the last time that we talked about this it issue. was a blow up i think it was just the decision i made okay. you didn't like. <laughs> well i i didn't like it feeling like we were getting yelled at so <clears throat> i just wanted to make sure that that's not going to be an issue Mark well Jensen. as long as it's not in the order that i signed we can get into it Yes, and it's reputation, it's not specific instances. I mean, we'll, let, let's talk about it in the morning, because I was going to bring it up myself. So we'll talk about it in the morning. Okay, and I have another timing issue. Um, we do have witnesses who have to testify tomorrow because they've traveled here. Um, and so, you know, depending on how long things take tomorrow, I might have to ask court and counsel to agree to break with this witness and get in the witnesses who have to go tomorrow. Um, that's possible. <laughs> They'll be available. Um, it's just, uh, and they're not extremely long witnesses. Tarika Krafasi and um, Stacy Bauer traveled. Uh, well, we, he needs to be while we're talking. We're good. He can go. We'll go. That's way too many questions before we go home. So just, just <laughs> alerting everybody that that's a thing. I understand. Try to talk to each other. You guys have seemed to been working.